Hello everyone and welcome to this talk on design patterns. Now, in this first video, I want to introduce the concept of design patterns, um, see what they are and what they are useful for, and also why you might want to use them in your coding and in your application or project. So what are design patterns? Design patterns are basically ways of solving similar problems in similar ways. Okay, so during our development, um, pretty much no matter what language you develop on, you will run into kind of the same issues and you might want to implement the same solutions. Okay, so design patterns gives us a way of fixing or solving a problem in a kind of accepted standard way. We know that these solutions work and we want to use them to implement them in our code. So design patterns will allow us to do that. They will allow us to um, have the certainty uh, to know that our solution does solve the problem, but also introduces some other things that we might want in addition to simply having a solution, whatever that solution may be. So these things might be uh, scalability, where your application or code might be able to grow um, when you add further functionality and further um, code to it. So scalability is one thing, testability is another. We want our application uh, or project to be tested in a simple way and we can introduce unit tests and more complex tests, okay? So design patterns um, allow us to do that. It also introduces separation of concerns, okay? So that means um, our code is split into uh, kind of blocks of code or components that each solve their individual problems. And this in turn leads to better architecture and better um, you know, scalability, maintainability, things like that. So that is uh, at the core, that is what design patterns are. In addition to all that, they introduce standard terminology. Okay, so we want to be able to discuss uh, the solutions to our problems um, in an easy way. And speaking to, let's say, developers or um, architects um, about your code, about your project, using design patterns um, provides an easy way to kind of communicate what you have done. So for example, if you say that you have implemented a builder pattern for a particular class, then the person you're talking to will automatically know what you are talking about. They introduce best practices, so that means um, what are the most efficient ways, the best ways to solve certain problems in your code. Um, in software development, we often have one right way to uh, fix, to solve a particular problem and many kind of wrong ways. Even though the solution might work, you might not get things like uh, separation of concerns if you, let's say, put everything in one code, right? So that would be an example of a um, wrong way to solve a problem. Uh, design patterns introduce best practices, the best way uh, that we have found to solve particular problems. Now, I want to introduce this term. You might have heard of it, the Gang of Four. The Gang of Four is basically a group of four um, software development architects um, that have put together the book uh, the uh, foundational book on design patterns, okay? And this is what this course is kind of based upon. Um, they describe, based on their experience, they describe the best ways to solve a lot of problems and come up with some solutions to common problems, okay? They have named these solutions design patterns. Um, they provide a number of them that we will cover here in this course. Okay, so this is what it's based on. Um, there is a book out by the Gang of Four. So if you want more information, um, check out that book as well. All right, so that's it for this introductory video. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one. All right, so the types of design patterns. Now, of course, we have different types of de design patterns depending on what we want to achieve with a particular pattern, okay? So in this video, we're gonna go through the three uh, types that we will cover in this course. The first one is going to be the creational type of design patterns. And the creational design patterns basically relate to how you create specific objects or specific components 
in your applications. Okay, so why do we have this? Well, we have different ways of creating it, creating objects or components depending on the requirements we put on those. So you can imagine, for instance, a class that has uh, multiple parameters. We want to, let's say, instantiate some parameters and not others. Um, and we want to do this in an efficient way to provide the quote unquote user, so the caller object, um, with a lot of options and a lot of possibilities. And this is what, where, for example, the builder pattern would come in. Okay, so um, different ways of creating objects or creating components in a way that achieves the nice to haves that we talked about. The second type of design patterns is the structural. And here we talk more about how we kind of structure our whole project, how we structure our application, um, to achieve certain objectives. This is sort of related to architecture, although architecture is kind of a, a broader view uh, which relates to components and which components um, are responsible for which uh, actions. Here in the structural design patterns, we take a kind of closer view, um, closer to the individual class or component and see how that component is structured um, in order to, again, achieve some nice to haves like testability, scalability, and so on. And the final type of design pattern is going to be the behavioral. And the behavioral pattern relates to how the components that we create behave in our application and interact with each other. Okay, so here is where we will see um, how we communicate between components based again on the structural types of design patterns. Here we see how those components that we have created kind of interact and communicate with each other. And here we will have quite a, a number of design patterns that we need to go through, but all are quite useful to know. And uh, I think you will use most in your development and in your projects. Okay, so this is kind of a broad view of what types of design patterns we have. And in this course, we have split the uh, structure of the course, we have sections for each individual type. Okay, so firstly, we will talk about all the creational patterns. Um, and we will begin that in the next section. Okay, so thank you for watching this video. And I will see you there. Okay, so let's get into it. The first design pattern we're going to talk about is the singleton. Now, if you've heard of one design pattern, this is probably the one you heard about. The singleton is probably the most well-known and the most talked about design pattern, both in a positive way and in a negative way. It's not necessarily the most used one um, or the most useful, but just that people uh, do talk about and know about the singleton. And we're going to cover the positives and negatives in this video. So let's take kind of a thought experiment um, to understand why the singleton might be useful. So let's say we have a project with three components, and these three components need to access some external resource, for example, an API um, on a network on the internet. So a naive solution to this would be to have a network communicator. We instantiate that network communicator every time we need to access that resource. So for example, for component one, we have its own instance. Component two has its own instance as well. And we communicate with the resource in this way. Now, there are a few problems with this. Um, so first of all, this is kind of resource inefficient. So you might be um, on a, uh, you know, a smaller device that doesn't have enough resources, or you might be on a server where you have a lot of um, access and you want to conserve your resources. In this case, creating three instances that do the same thing, um, that is not a very efficient solution. Also, you might want to have some sorting, some ordering of requests in this communication, okay? So um, you might want to serve each request as it comes in and order those, those requests if that is important. Okay. Also, for testing purposes, this is not very efficient because you cannot, um, you shouldn't really test multiple instances of the same thing. So a better solution would be to have a singleton, which is going to be a single instance of this network communicator. And then all the components that require that functionality will access that network communicator. Okay. So this is kind of the idea behind the singleton. 
put a central resource in a single instance of that resource rather than duplicating it multiple times. Okay, so only one instance. It's a single point of access for a resource. And we've taken the example of a network communicator, but we might have, for example, a database or a logging system or things like that where you want a single resource. Okay, so here are a few examples, but of course it's not limited to that. Now, as I mentioned, there are some disadvantages to singletons and people are often um, quite against this pattern. The main ideas, the main reasons why people don't like them are, first of all, it breaks the single responsibility principle, which means that um, a singleton will basically manage its own state and will allow others to create only one instance. And this is not ideal. This is often a code smell, a quote unquote code smell, which simply means that a particular class should um, create a component when required, whereas the singleton creates its own instance, okay? So this is not ideal. Also, testability issues might come in since the singleton kind of handles multiple situations, multiple cases, multiple components will access that singleton by its very nature where you have a single instance of a component that means you couple tightly um, the components that need the singleton with the singleton instance. Okay, so this kind of reduces testability. You cannot really mock a singleton in a test since you have only one instance and you need to, um, you know, kind of get around that in some way. Also, um, you have a state for the lifetime of your application. Okay, so once the singleton has been instantiated, you can only use that particular instance. Of course, you could implement a solution where you kind of kill that instance in some situations and recreate it, but that would break the principle behind the singleton, okay? So that means once a singleton is instantiated, you have your state for the lifetime of your application and that causes some issues. All right, so enough with the theoretical introduction, let's go to our editor and start to implement a singleton in our code. Now here I am using PyCharm for development, but you can use any editor you like. And I've just simply created a new project here. Okay, so let me just delete that file. All right, now we're going to, let me just create a Python file. We're going to implement the singleton in two different ways. The first way is going to be a naive implementation where we implement a singleton that works, but I will show you a particular case where it doesn't work. To kind of um, tell you straight away what the issue is, uh, it works in a single thread, but not in a multi-threaded environment. Okay, so we're gonna implement this naive implementation and then we're going to see what the solution is and how we can fix the multi-threaded implementation. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna have a naive singleton. So let's implement this naive singleton. I'm gonna have a class with a singleton and I'm going to have a type here. Okay, I'm going to have underscore instances is going to be this empty dictionary and I'm going to override the call method. So def underscore underscore call. And I have here self args and kw args. Now uh, I'm gonna say if um, self not in self dot underscore instances. So it, if we don't have that instance, then we will create it. So instance equals super dot call. Okay, here we have args and kw args. Okay, and then we're going to have self dot underscore instances of underscore, uh, sorry, self equals instance. Okay, and outside my if, I'm gonna say return self dot instances of self. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking, does this instance exist? And if it doesn't, then I create it. 
and I add it to my dictionary. If it does exist, then I don't need to create it again and I simply return it. Okay, so that will just create um, a single instance for my singleton class. Okay, I'm going to have here a class network driver with a meta class singleton. Okay, and here I will just have a method define log of self and I'm going to print, um, I'm going to print an F string and I'm going to have self and I want a slash N at the end. Um, that should be, I put self here twice. There we go. So um, I will just define a method that prints out my instance of my class. Okay. And then finally, I will have a def create singleton. Okay, no parameters here. And I want to have singleton equals network driver, singleton dot log, and I will return singleton. Okay, so that is my creation function. So here I will have a main and I will say, let me just put a um, comment here, single thread. Okay, so we're on a single thread. I'm going to say S1 equals create singleton and S2 equals create singleton. Okay, so I create two singletons, but obviously if this works, as it should, then only one singleton will be created. Okay, so let me go ahead and run this, the naive, quote unquote naive singleton, and we can see here that the created objects are exactly the same. Now, the problem comes when we uh, implement a multi-threaded environment. I've just realized that the text is quite small, so let me just um, update this. Uh, let me search for font. Font size 16, let's put it to 20, hopefully. What is happening? Okay, so hopefully that is easier to see. Now, um, so as I mentioned, this is a single thread, so let's add a um, here multi-thread. All right, so for multi-thread, we're gonna say uh, process P1 for process one equals, I need a thread of course. So let me just go at the top here and I'm gonna say imp, uh, from threading import thread. Okay, so I have my thread. Let me put a space here. Okay, going down, I have uh, P1 equals thread and I have target equals create singleton. Okay, and I will have P2 equals thread with target equals create singleton. So this will create two singletons on two threads. So let's see how this works. If I run this, um, okay, so I need to comment out the creation because the creation, once the creation is done, of course, the singleton is uh, created. So we will get the same thing. And I'm thinking uh, because this creation here can happen really quickly, I would need a bit of slowdown. So in a real world situation, this might be delayed to, you know, instantiate some resource. So I want to simulate that. I'm going to put here import time. If I type this correctly, import time. And I want to simulate here that this might take, let's say, um, time.sleep for one second. So it will take, let's say, one second to create the singleton. And in this case, that will cause some issues. Okay. The way I've done, the reason I've done this here is because in a real world situation, it takes some time to instantiate some resources on your machine. So for example, instantiating a connection to a database or to a network communicator or whatever it is. 
Okay, so um, with that, let's run our naive singleton. And and I've just forgotten here to say p1.start and p2.start. Okay, so running that again. This should be a should not be a function call. All right, we got there in the end. Okay, so um, sorry about that. There was a bit of confusion, but in the end, um, we basically create two threads. We start them, and as we can see here, we create two different um, objects of this class, right? Here we have four zero. Here we have d zero. So these are two different instances of our supposedly single instance class. Okay, so that is a problem um, in a multi-threaded environment. So how do we actually fix this? Let's go ahead and create a new Python file. Um, here we have, let's say, thread safe singleton. Okay, um, I'm just going to copy everything from here and paste it here. Um, the way we solve this is once we start to implement, start to create our singleton, we need to have a lock um, so that we lock the thread so that other threads cannot access it here. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm going to add lock here uh, from threading. And in my singleton class, I'm gonna have underscore lock is going to be um, lock. All right, so I have my lock and in my call uh, function, I'm going to say with, um, here I have self.lock, okay? And I'm gonna put my if inside this with block. Okay, so with that done, I think the rest should stay the same and I'm going to just run this and you can see that we have the same instance for both threads. So what is happening here is basically whenever we enter this function call, we lock the thread to check whether or not there's an instance. Okay, so that is all that we need to do. Once we have that determined, then we can simply return the instance that is available. So that is how you would implement the singleton for multi-threaded environments. All right, so in this video, we're gonna talk about the factory method. Now, here is the problem that this design pattern will try to solve. So first of all, in our development, in our projects, oftentimes requirements change and we do need to go into the code and change some particular aspects depending on what new functionality is needed or we need to refactor the code that we have to adapt to new changes, okay? So um, this is where factory method will come in because it will cause kind of a separation between uh, the creator of an object and the user of that object, right? So that means this separation will allow us to change our code more easily without impacting a lot of our code. Now, dynamic switching is also a quite interesting topic because in a real life situation, you might have, for example, you might have multiple data sources or you might have multiple databases and you want to be able to switch between those databases in a dynamic way based on certain requirements um, in that particular moment, okay? So we don't want to have a tight coupling between the user of the object and the creator of the object so that we can change that object dynamically based on other requirements. Also, there is the principle of separation of concerns, which means that you want to separate the creation from the utilization, okay? This is kind of a general principle in software development. So how does factory method help with all of this? First of all, the design logic and the creation or instantiation of an object is hidden from the client. So the client doesn't really know how to create the object, it just knows how to use it. So that means multiple classes of objects will be able to uh, be created and the client will have access to it without knowing which exact type it is actually using. We have many subclass types, 
but only one instance, right? So as I mentioned, we can have multiple classes, multiple uh, types of objects, but as long as the utilization or the interface is the same, then we only need one instance and we don't really care which instance, which type it is. Creation is removed from the client. Obviously, we need another object that creates objects or another class that creates objects. And then this is useful for frequent code changes. So when we want to update our code, when we want to introduce another type of uh, this, uh, you know, object or this component, um, this is where the factory method really shines because the separation is done in a way that we can just add or subtract multiple types and the code will still work seamlessly without impacting too much. So to kind of give you an overview, how this will work is here we have, for example, three types of databases, okay? We have instances of these databases. These connect to their respective databases and use their particular language. However, all of these objects that access the database will have the same interface. So that means this interface um, will allow us to communicate with either one of these without really caring about which particular instance we are dealing with. And then we have the database factory in this example. This is a generic factory that creates the particular instance that uh, at that particular time is required, okay? So this is where the separation kind of comes in. The client doesn't really know or doesn't really particularly care which instance it is using as long as it gets an instance with this particular interface. So you see the separation here between utilization and creation. So the components that are required basically will be an interface or an abstract class that defines the common functionality, the implementations, one or more, uh, as many as we need, and we can add, as the project kind of grows and matures, we can add more implementations based on that particular interface. And then the factory class that instantiates the right implementation for that particular use case, for that particular situation. All right, so that is all for the theoretical introduction. Let's move to our uh, code, and I'm gonna create a new file here, new Python file, and I'm gonna call this factory underscore method. All right, so in the factory method, we're gonna add, first of all, we're gonna add some objects to kind of serve as um, the things that we kind of move around and pass around in our code. So here I'm gonna have a class country. And what I would like to do, I'm gonna just pass here. What I would like to do with this code is I would like to have a kind of quote unquote currency factory that will give us the currency for that particular country, okay? And we will have multiple instances of those currencies. We will see how uh, that works. So I have my class country and I will have another class here, let's say USA, that is a subtype of country. I'm going to pass here. I will have class, let's say Spain, country, pass, and let's add one more class, Japan, which is also a country. All right, now um, let's create a kind of abstract class. However, uh, since Python doesn't natively support that, we need to import from ABC, import um, ABC and abstract method so that we can create abstract methods. And down here, we will say class, currency factory, okay? This is going to inherit from ABC and we're going to have an abstract method. Let's define currency underscore factory, okay? We have ourself, but we need to pass the country here and we will return a string. And for now we're gonna pass. Okay, so this is the abstract method, um, which will allow us to implement our, um, our factory. Okay, so we have our currency factory. Now let's define, uh, this is our interface. Let's define our, let's say fiat, which is the usual kind of money that you have in a country, the usual currency, uh, current fiat currency factory and this is going to be a currency factory. Okay, so we're going to define here our currency factory, 
that returns a string and we're going to say if country is USA then return uh, USD United States dollar elif country is Spain then return euros else I forgot there we go um, else return JPY Japanese yen okay so um, very simple very standard now let's create another one that's going to be virtual currency factory and this is also going to be a currency factory let me just copy and paste this because it's going to be exactly the same however here instead of usd let's return let's say bitcoin for spain let's return ethereum and for japan obviously we're going to return dogecoin okay so we have our factory so now we need to we can simply have a uh, client code so let's implement our main we're going to have f1 equals fiat currency factory and f2 is going to be virtual currency factory okay so now if we use f1 we're going to say print f1 dot currency factory and we're going to do that for usa and that's going to create the um, usd and let me just duplicate that two times and instead of usa i'm going to have spain and i'm going to have japan here okay so this is all with f1 and i'm going to copy and paste and i'm going to replace this with f2 okay so this should generate all the coins all the currency that we have in our application there we go so usd euros japan and then japanese yen and then we have bitcoin ethereum and dogecoin all right so that is the implementation for the factory method so you can see the use is uh, where we use in our code in our main code is separated from the creation right um, we don't know how to instantiate these currencies, but the factory itself does. So that is uh, really useful in a lot of uh, situations in your project. Abstract factory is, you can think of it as kind of one level of abstraction above the factory method. And it is simply put, it is a factory that creates factories. Okay, so just one level up. So let's see how this works in practice. So let's imagine we have a data source here, um, data source type, this is an interface, and then we have database, we have user input network, and whatever other data sources we might want, we might have. All of these have underneath them, they have certain uh, types. So for example, the database might have SQL database, MySQL database, or whatever type of database. So you can think of this as kind of a factory for uh, databases, factory for user inputs, and so on. Now, which one we use doesn't really matter from the point of view of the user which is in our case is going to be the display. So the display doesn't really care where it gets the data as long as data is retrieved in the way that it wants. So in this case, we can have a data source factory, which is kind of higher level abstraction, which gives us the data source, whatever that data source may be. Okay, so the data source factory instantiates the actual factory that we're going to use, which in turn will allow us to access the resource. Okay, so this is how it works. We have a data source factory here. We instantiate the particular database factory, network factory, or whatever we will need. And then that in turn will be uh, will implement the data source okay and i haven't drawn here but obviously the database and network will um, will retrieve the actual information so abstract factory provides a way to access functionality without caring about implementation this is kind of true for the factory method as well but as i mentioned this is a one level up 
And in this case, we don't even care about which factory we use, okay? So we want to abstract that information away as well. One level of abstraction higher. And again, it is a uh, it follows the principle of separation of concerns, okay? So we don't care about how we use, sorry, we don't care about how we create the, ob the object, we only care about using that implementation. And again, here it allows for testability. So we separate the concerns, we separate the components in our application, and therefore we can more easily uh, test components in isolation. Okay, so that is how, um, that is the theoretical introduction. Let's move to code. And here we are in our editor. I am in PyCharm, but you can use whatever you like, obviously. I'm going to create a abstract factory file. First of all, like in the factory method, I'm going to say from ABC import ABC and abstract method. Okay, so that we can create abstract classes. Now, what I would like to do here is I would like to have kind of a uh, a practical example, and we're going to implement a quote unquote restaurant factory. Okay, so we want to have a particular type of food as a client, as a user, I want to decide what kind of food I want, and then I would like to go to a restaurant. So I don't really care which restaurant it is. Obviously, in a real world situation, you might care for other reasons. But in our situation here, we don't care what restaurant as long as we get the type of food that we want. So the abstract factory is going to be kind of the restaurant creator. The uh, factory implementation, we're going to have a, uh, let's say, American and French restaurants. And the client, the user, is going to just care about the food that it receives. Okay, so let's implement that. We're going to have a class food type. And we're going to have French equals one and then American equals two. Okay, so we have our food type. Now let's create an abstract factory. Let me put here an abstract factory here. And I'm going to have class restaurant. And this is going to be ABC. And the restaurant is going to be, uh, is going to have an abstract method. Let's say define make food. And this is just going to have self. Um, we're going to pass for now. And let's define another method, method, abstract method, define make drink. Okay. And we're going to pass for now. All right, so let's define a class restaurant that inherits from ABC. We're going to have an abstract method. Um, let's say define make food. Okay, we're going to pass for now and another abstract method define make drink. Okay, and we're going to pass. All right, so we have our restaurant kind of interface. And here we're going to create a first type of restaurant that's going to be French restaurant, which obviously will inherit from restaurant. So here we need to define make food. And we're going to just print some food that we make, let's say cordon bleu. Okay, and then we're going to define make drink and we're going to print something like Merlot. Okay, so that is our French restaurant. Um, we're going to also define a American restaurant. Okay, so these are all factories, right? So restaurant and we're going to have our make food. Here, we're going to print hamburger and define make drink. And we're going to print something like Coca-Cola. Okay, typical American food. Right, so um, now we want to have our uh, abstract factory. So let's define um, a restaurant factory. Okay, so the client, the user doesn't really care which type of restaurant 
they care which type, but doesn't, they don't really care which instance of the restaurant, right? So that's what the restaurant factory will create. So, um, here we will have a def, let's say, suggest restaurant based on, um, here we will have a type, which is going to be food type. I think type overrides some uh, built in type. So let's say R type, restaurant type. Okay, so we have our R type. And now we can say if R type equals food type dot French, then return French restaurant, else return American restaurant. Okay, so we have our restaurant factory. Now we just need a client method, def dine at, and here we have our restaurant of type restaurant, right? So this is going to simply print line. Um, let's say for dinner, we are having, I forgot to put the quotes. The, right. So for dinner we are having, then we will simply call the method in the restaurant. So make food and restaurant dot make drink. Okay. So that is the client method. And we of course need a main here. We have, let's say suggestion, suggestion one is going to be restaurant factory dot suggest restaurant. And let's say first we want some French food. So food type dot French. And then for suggestion two is going to be restaurant factory dot suggest restaurant food type dot American. Okay. So the first suggestion is going to print our French food and drink the second one, American food and drink. So we're going to dine at the first suggestion and then dine at suggestion two. Okay, so pretty uh, self-explanatory. I think the abstract factory, the restaurant factory will basically create the factories that we have, French and American, and these in turn will um, share a common interface, which we have defined here as restaurant. So we can actually use them in the client without really caring which type there are, which instance they are. We know the food that we want. And based on that, the factory method, the abstract factory uh, defines our restaurant, but we don't really care about the instance. Okay. So here is where we use it and we just call that in dine at. So let's run this. The only thing I forgot here is to make this method static. It's also a suggestion there. So we could just create a, um, we could create a instance here, but this is, uh, this should be easier, right? So this is static for some reason, the types have disappeared. So food type dot French and food type dot American, right? So since this is a static method, we can now access it. So let's go ahead and run this. There we go. So it is working as expected for dinner. We are having French food and then American food. All right. That is all for the, um, abstract factory. Uh, design pattern. All right. In this video, we're going to talk about the builder pattern. Now the builder pattern is really useful in many situations because it allows us to have an object that is initialized in different ways. So you can think about an object that has multiple parameters that we need to initialize. And in some situations, we might want to use some parameters. In others, we might want to use another set of parameters, right? So the builder allows us to be flexible when initializing an object. For example, if we have many parameters, it's quite impractical to build all constructors, to build the object that has the uh, multitude of options when it comes to building it. So for example, if we have five parameter combinations, that will give us 120 constructors. So we don't want to list kind of all uh, possible permutations and combinations of these parameters. We have some optional parameters in our objects, which means that some parameters are 
uh, you know, mandatory, others are optional. So we might exclude them if we want to when building our object. And in addition, it should be quite easy to read. Okay. So we should, we should have a way to construct the object that is easy to understand and easy to use by whoever wants to instantiate that particular object. All right, so that is all for the quick introduction. Now we're going to move to our code. Um, and we're actually going to see two ways of putting in place this builder pattern in Python. One is the classical way and one is kind of a simplified way to achieve the same thing in an easier way. All right, so let's start with the first one. I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call this builder. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a class called network service where I can instantiate it with uh, different parameters. We're just going to have three parameters in our example, but you can add uh, many more if you like. So you can kind of visualize how that would be. So let's have a class network service. And we're going to define our init method here. And we're just going to say self.components is going to be an empty dictionary. All right, so we're going to add a key of type string and a value of also type string. And we're just going to say self.components of key is going to be value. Okay, easy enough. And we also want to just print out our components to see what we have there. So here we have dot show. Okay. And I'm going to say print self dot components. Okay. So that is our network service. It's quite simple, but as you can see, we can add as many parameters as we like here. Now for the purposes of this design pattern, we're going to have a class network service builder, which we're actually going to use to instantiate our network service. So here I'm going to define an init method, self dot um, underscore service is going to be a network service. All right, now let's add a few things. So first of all, we might want to add a target URL to our network service, right? So def add target URL. And here we have our URL of type string. So what this does is basically it says self dot underscore service dot add, and we have a key URL and our value URL. Okay, easy enough. That's the target URL. Let's define a couple more. Let's say add auth. Okay, so that's authorization. And here we have self and auth of type string. Okay, um, we're going to say self service dot add. We're going to have the key authorization. And we're going to have the value auth. Okay, and finally, we're going to add um, something like cache. Add cache or rather caching, because this is just the time interval for the cache. Okay, so caching, and here we're going to have our cache of type int. Okay, and we're going to say self dot underscore service dot add. Here we're going to have cache control, which is how you would um, spell that in the um, URL headers. Okay, and here we have our cache. Okay, that's going to be converted to an to a string automatically. Now we're going to define also a method build that will return us a network service. Okay, so we're going to simply say here, uh, sorry, service equals self dot underscore service. I want to reset this underscore service. So underscore service equals network service. So reinstantiate that. And then I'm going to just return our service. Okay, that is fine. So here we have our builder and now we're going to use it in our main. So let me define the main. And we're going to just say here builder 
equals network service builder. And now we can use it to create our network service. So first of all, we will create a very simple network service that doesn't have authorization and doesn't have caching. So we're going to say builder dot add target URL. That's the only thing we're going to need. And let's say google.com. Okay. So we have our first network service. We're going to say service one equals builder dot build and then service one dot show. Okay. So we're just going to print it out. Now this has been reset. Okay. So we have it here. We reset it. So we're going to create a new one. We're going to say builder dot add target URL. Let's say youtube.com. We're going to say builder dot um, add auth. Okay, so here we have, let's say, ABC123. This is the key for the authorization. And finally, we're going to add caching. And let's say this is 60,000 milliseconds. That's one minute. And then if we do service two equals builder dot build, and then service two dot show. Okay, so that should basically build our two services. So let's go ahead and run this and we will get the first one. We have only the parameter that we have instantiated and the second one, we have all three parameters. Okay, so very, very uh, clear, I would say, how we use this builder to instantiate the network service. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have an actually a simpler way to do kind of the same thing. So this is the classic way you would build a builder. Okay. If you require some more complex functionality, but let's keep it simple and let's create a new file builder two. And in this file, we're going to build the same thing, except we're going to take advantage of the named parameters that we have in Python. Okay. So we're going to have class, um, network service. Okay. And here we're going to have our init function, but here the difference is we're going to pass all parameters here in the init function, and we're going to give them default values. So URL of type string and empty by default, empty string, we're going to have auth of type string also empty by default, and we're going to have cache of type int, and that is going to be zero by default. So here we're going to build our dictionary. So self.components is going to be an empty dictionary. Now we're going to say if URL. Okay. So if this is not empty, then we're going to just add it to our components. So self.components of URL is going to be our URL. And we're going to do the same thing for the other. So if auth self dot components of auth, this is authorization is going to be equals to auth. And then if cache, so if this is not zero, because this is an integer, we're going to say self dot components of cache control is going to be our cache. Okay. Very, very simple. So this is kind of equivalent to what we had previously. And now let's define our show function. And here we're just going to, like before, we're just going to print self dot components. All right. So we have that. And now that is basically all we need. Okay. So this is equivalent to these two, um, to these two classes. So now we can use our main. And we can say here service one is going to be equal to network service. And here we have the option to provide the names of the parameters. So we're going to have URL google.com and we're going to leave it at that and say service one dot show. Okay. And service two is going to be network service and we're going to provide more parameters this time. So we're going to say URL equals uh, youtube.com. We're going to say auth equals ABC123 and cache equals, uh, what did we say here? 60,000. 
Okay, and service to dot show. So that is basically all we need. This is equivalent to all of this, right? So let's go ahead and run this code. And then we get the correct output, what we were expecting. So that is the builder pattern. It is quite useful, um, especially the second version that I've shown you here. It is quite useful and quite often used to uh, provide optional parameters in your initialization. Okay, so you will find it quite often um, in code. All right, the last of the creational patterns that we're gonna talk about is the prototype. Now, here is the problem that this is trying to solve. So let's say in our code, we have some existing object. It can be of pretty much any complexity. And for some reason, we need a copy of that object, okay? So we don't want to kind of create a new object from scratch uh, and then go through the whole process because this particular object might already have some state in it or has gone through uh, user interaction or some other reason, right? So there is some complexity in this existing object and we just need a simple copy of that object. How do we do that? Well, the problem here is that we cannot simply copy uh, the existing object because some fields, uh, for example, might not be visible in that object, right? So we cannot go and kind of get each field individually and initialize a field with the same name in the new object. We cannot go one by one. Also, we might only have an interface to that object. We might not have the uh, reference, the object itself, right? So we might not know exactly what we're dealing with. Also, um, a kind of a third problem in copying uh, line by line or field by field is it requires tight coupling in the sense that we would have to know exactly the structure of that class uh, of the initial object that we're trying to copy, okay? So that's obviously uh, going to lead to tight coupling, which is not ideal. So what does this prototype um, need to do? First of all, it lets us copy existing objects, okay? Quite simple. Um, we will not be depending on their class. That is um, quite necessary. We can have situations where we only rely on an interface, the copied object must provide the copy functionality. So we don't want to externalize this functionality outside the existing object. We want the object itself to provide the copy functionality because the object itself will have access to everything that it needs um, and it avoids tight coupling on the outside, okay? So it will have access to its private fields. It will have access to all the required functionality, to its state and so on. And then finally, this is quite useful in testing and pre-production. So for example, you might have a live uh, system where you have certain long-lived objects like a database connectivity or some user state management object, something like that. If you want to test that object or you want to kind of uh, provide some pre-production staging environment, then you want to be able to copy uh, those objects into your second system. Okay, so quite useful. All right, so that is the kind of theoretical overview. Let's go to our code. Now, the good news is that Python out of the box provides us with this copy functionality. We just need to kind of import it in our project and know how to use it. So let's go ahead and create a new file here. And I'm gonna call this prototype. Okay, now the copy functionality is going to be in um, a copy uh, package. So we're going to import copy. Okay, and I'm also going to import, um, sorry, from ABC, import ABC and abstract method so that we can define kind of abstract functionality. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna have kind of a uh, theoretical example. We're going to have a shape structure. Um, these are the objects that we're gonna have in our code and we're going to, using the shapes, we're going to build a quote unquote uh, abstract art functionality, okay? So an object that uh, combines these shapes together to provide some output and we want to copy this uh, art, okay? So we're going to have here class shape that inherits from ABC and we're going to have an abstract method, def um, draw 
and we're going to pass for now. Okay, so with this shape, we're going to have a class square. That is a shape. And we're going to define the init function here with a size parameter. So we're going to say self.size equals size. And obviously, we need to define the draw method that simply prints out a f string drawing a square of size and the size that we have, self.size. Okay, so that is our square. Let's define one more. We're going to have a circle here, which is also a shape, very similar in it. We're going to add a parameter radius and we're going to say self dot um, radius equals radius and def draw a print a f string drawing a circle of radius self dot radius. All right, so very good so far. Now, uh, we're going to have an object that we will eventually copy, and that's going to be class um, abstract art. Okay, um, here we're going to have an init. We're going to override the init and we're going to say, let's say we have a background color and we're going to have our shapes. So self dot BG color equals BG color and self dot shapes equals shapes. So shapes is going to be a list. So we're going to say def draw. Okay, and we're going to just print um, a f string background color is self dot bg color. And we're going to print all the shapes. So I have x dot draw for x in shapes. Um, x dot draw a function call here. All right, so we have our abstract art and we need to just have a main where we can create some objects. So here, let's create some shapes. That is going to be a list. Let's say we have a square of five. We have another square of three. And we have a circle of eight, for example. And then we can create an art one object that is going to be an abstract art where we provide the background color as red and provide these shapes. Okay, so, so far so good. Now this is quite basic, quite simple functionality. Um, the prototype part comes just now with this copy functionality. So as I mentioned, we get this uh, by default out of the box. So we can say art2 equals copy dot copy. We have two options here. We have copy and deep copy. The only difference is that um, with copy, the objects that you have inside your copied object will be copied by reference, whereas the deep copy will be copied, will copy the objects themselves as well. So copy just gives you references, uh, deep copy gives you copies. Okay, so I'm just gonna use copy. Um, in our example, the output is the same, the result is the same whether we use copy or deep copy. So here we have dot copy of art one, and we're going to have art one dot draw and art two dot draw. Okay, so we're just gonna print them out just to see that they are exactly the same. So running that, we get the art one and art two. Okay, so they are exactly the same. They have uh, the same parameters and the kind of um, prototype pattern was implemented automatically for us, was given to us uh, out of the box with the copy um, package. 
All right, so the first of the structural design patterns that we're gonna talk about is the adapter. And the adapter is kind of the, maybe the easiest to understand of the patterns. Um, what it does is simply it converts one interface of one class into another interface that the client expects. What this means is, is that we might have in our code, we might use a, uh, a third party library, or we might have some part of our code that is used in multiple places. Um, so that means we cannot actually modify that particular class or that particular interface. So what we want to do is we need to convert the interface that we do have control over, um, and we want to be able to access the third party library or third party interface in an easy way. So we cannot contact it. We cannot access it directly because these two interfaces uh, are more or less incompatible. So what we do need is some sort of adapter between our interface and the third party um, interface. Or we can think of it as converting data from one format into another. Whether we're talking about interfaces or data, we still need, need this kind of adapter between the two types. So here is a small diagram to kind of show you um, in graphic form what we mean. We have a client that has a target API or target interface, and we need to call this adapt T interface that we cannot modify, have no control over. So what we do is we implement this adapter class that converts the call that we have in our code to this specific call in the third party library. We don't want to put this functionality, this adapter functionality in our target because we want this kind of separation of concerns. And also we might not want to modify the target if it's used in multiple places in our code. So the best solution is to have this separate adapter class that converts from one type to another or converts the data from one type to another. All right, so let's move to our code and let's go ahead and create a new file here. And I'm going to call this adapter. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have um, a type of data in the third party library. We're going to implement that and kind of think of it as immutable. We don't have access to it. And we're going to then implement this adapter class that converts from one data type to another. So first things first, let's go ahead and import from data classes, import data class. And let's define here a data class. And I'm going to call this class display data type. Okay. And this will just have an index of type float and it will have some data of type string. Okay, so I'm going to mark this as third party functionality. Okay, we don't have access to it. We cannot modify this um, functionality. Also in the third party functionality, we have a display data class. Okay, and this has an init where we have some display data of type display data type. And we just want to uh, store it for now. So we're going to say self dot display data equals display data. And we have some functionality. So let's say def show data. Okay. And we're going to just print line an F string third party functionality. Um, Okay, we're going to have here self dot display data dot index. We're going to put some dash line and then self dot display data dot data. Okay, so we just want to show the data in a certain way. And we're going to assume that this is kind of third party functionality. It's a bit more complex, but we're going to simplify it here just for the purposes of this code. All right, so what do we do with this uh, data type? We cannot simply use it. Let's say we want to store it in some database. This is display data, so we cannot just simply um, access it as it is. And here we're going to implement some uh, of our own functionality, so our code. Okay, this is part of our functionality. Let's say we define a data class 
um, class database data type. Okay, and this has a position of type int, and it also has a, let's say, amount of type int. All right, so we have our code. Now here we also have a class store data, store database data. Okay, we're going to define an init function. Okay, here we have database data of type database data type self dot database data equals database data. And we're going to have some local functionality, some of our, our own code functionality. Let's say store underscore data. Okay, we pass some data here and we'll just print it out. So print an F string database data stored. And let's just display the data. So self dot database data dot um, position, some dash line, and then self dot database data dot amount. All right, so this is our functionality. So what we want to do is we want to access this show data, but we don't want to do it directly for the reasons that we mentioned previously. So what we're going to do here, we're going to create a class uh, display data adapter. Okay, and in this display data adapter, we're going to inherit from store database data and display data. So we're going to use both. We're going to have an init function that retrieves some data, self.data equals data. Okay, and we're going to define our store data. Okay, let's print a message to know that we are in this uh, code. So call our code, but use third party code. Okay, so we're adapting our code to the third party. And then we're going to say for item in um, self dot data, we're going to convert the data type. So we're going to say DDT equals display data type. Okay, we're going to say we're going to convert to float um, item dot position. And then we're going to convert to a string the item dot amount. Okay, so this is um, very specific to your code to your functionality. In our case, we're converting the data that is passed to us, which is position and amount, we're converting that to our display data type so that we can call our show data. Okay, so we're with that, let's go ahead and say self dot display data equals DDT. And we're going to call self dot show data. Okay, so we're storing the data in the right way, which is required by the third party library. And then we're just calling the functionality. You can see here that the specific call to the third party functionality is encapsulated in our adapter. So the actual stored data database data is not actually changed. Okay, so we're just adapting this call to the third party functionality. All right, so with that, let's have a function here def generate underscore data. Okay, and this will generate our uh, list. So let's say data is going to be a list and data dot append um, database data type. We're just going to generate some function, some data here, let's say two and two. Let me just duplicate this twice. And let's just change the values here three and seven and nine and one. Okay, so this is the data that we're trying to adapt. And we're going to return data. Okay, so now we have our main implementation, we're going to uh, instantiate the adapter equals display data adapter. And here we're going to pass the generate data. And then finally, adapter dot 
stored data. Okay, so we're calling our functionality, but in reality, we're using the third party functionality. Okay, let's just remove a few lines here so that the compiler is happy. And then I'm going to run the adapter. I think I just made a mistake here. We don't actually need this call here since we have the self.data. Okay, so just remove that, try it again and run. Okay, another small mistake. Instead of display data type, we're not actually creating. We need to create our own data type. So instead of display data type, we're gonna ha have database data type. My mistake there. Okay, so basically we are using our own code. We're not using the third party uh, code. The third party is going to be restricted to the adapter. So this has to be a database data type. All right, let's run it. And then we get our correct functionality. So we are calling our code, but using the third party code and third party functionality has been converted, right? So our data converted to this data type. All right, that is it for the adapter pattern. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video. All right, so let's now talk about the bridge pattern. Now the bridge pattern is very useful when we have uh, multiple inheritance in our code. So you can imagine a part of our code, a class that needs to inherit from multiple um, other classes, multiple components. Um, that class is uh, will be composed of a certain number of other parts and other components. Um, the issue here is that the more of these components we have in our class, the more this class needs to handle different functionality in different cases. So separation of concerns is kind of broken here since one class will handle multiple aspects. So let's have a quick theoretical diagram um, to kind of illustrate this point. So here I have a class that inherits kind of two components. One is going to be shape and one of is going to be color. So this will need to handle basically all these kind of permutations, right? Red circle, blue circle, red square and blue square. A better solution um, in this case would be to kind of separate these two components, shape and color into their own classes. And you can imagine here if we add another dimension, one, two, three other dimensions, then these this inheritance will kind of grow exponentially, right? So the better solution is to separate these two components. One is going to be shape and that's going to handle circle and square and another is going to be color, red and blue. And here we have the relationship between the two, which is what we call the bridge. Okay, so having classes with multiple orthogonal traits, multiples of these components exponentially increases the size of the tree, right? So the more we have dimensions here, the more we have permutations down below. At its most basic, the bridge pattern converts from inheritance to composition. So we no longer inherit from multiple components, we compose them in our class and let each component kind of manage its own state and its own uh, functionality. We split into multiple interfaces and multiple classes, as we've seen here, instead of having one that handles everything, we have two that are composed within our code. And then finally, we associate them using a bridge reference. Okay, now this is kind of a theoretical introduction. Let's move to code and see how that works in practice. All right, so here I'm going to create a new file, new Python file called bridge. All right, now the first thing I need to do is from ABC import ABC and abstract method. I want to be able to set a few abstract methods um, in my upper class, in my uh, main class. So here I will define class device. All right, so to give you a description of what we're going to do here is we're going to have um, a few different types of devices and a remote control to control those devices. And we're gonna connect them through a bridge. Okay, so the first thing we need to define is the device that's going to inherit from ABC. We're going to set a volume variable equal to zero, and we're going to define an abstract method, def get name. Okay, and here 
we will simply return a string. Now, since this is an abstract method, we're going to pass for now, and we're going to use this class in our inheritance. So class, first of all, let's say we have a radio that is a device, and here we have get name, and we will return an F string, something like radio self. Okay, very simple. Now let's define another one that's going to be TV, which is also a device. We're going to override the abstract method. And here we will return an F string TV self. Okay, quite um, simple and straightforward so far. Now let's define the remote class. So class remote ABC. And here we will have two abstract methods. The first one is going to be def volume up. Okay, we're going to pass since we are in the abstract class. And then we're going to define an, another abstract method def volume down. And again, pass. Okay, so now we have the remote base class, we're going to define a class basic remote, which is going to be a remote. And we're going to define an init method, where we pass the device that this remote is for. Okay, so here we have our device. Um, you will notice here that we don't really specify which particular device it is, we can pass whatever device we like. So here we're just going to store self dot device equals device. All right, now let's implement the abstract method. So volume up, and that's going to be self dot device dot volume plus equals one. And then print an F string, um, we're going to say self dot device dot get name. Okay, volume up. And then we're going to print out the volume self dot device dot volume. All right, so that's volume up, we're going to define volume down in a similar fashion self dot device dot volume minus equals one. And then let me just copy this code. And then we're going to say volume down to this level. So that is basically all we need to do. Now let's define a main function. And here we will have a radio and a TV. Okay, and of course, we need two remotes, one for radio and one for TV. So radio remote equals basic remote of our radio and TV remote is going to be basic remote of TV. All right, so we have those. Now let's go ahead and change up the volume a bit. So radio remote dot volume up. Okay, we're going to say radio remote dot volume up and finally dot volume down. Okay, and we're going to do something similar for TV remote dot volume up. TV remote dot volume down, let's say volume down. And then let's say TV remote dot volume up and duplicate that. So um, just kind of random, randomly changing the, uh, the volume for those two. So you can kind of see how we work here, we have our basic remote, and we have a bridge to our device. Okay, so we connect those um, in this way, and we can manipulate them, uh, regardless of which a particular type of device we pass here. Okay, so if I run the bridge, then I would get the radio volume one, two, and then back down to one, the TV one, then back to zero, and then increase it twice. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea of how the bridge pattern works. We have only two dimensions in our case, we have device and remote, but you can imagine a code where we have multiple of these uh, dimensions. And in this case, the bridge pattern will be even more useful than it is here.
All right, so the composite design pattern is often used when we need to apply a certain functionality to a structure in our code. And most often that structure is going to be a tree of components within our code, right? So um, let's have a look at a quick high level example here. So here we have a computer um, that is composed among other things of memory, hard drive and a processor. And the memory itself is composed of a random access memory and a read only memory. And you can imagine this kind of tree structure going much deeper. Um, each of these components can be subdivided into other components and so on and so forth, right? But I've simplified it here to just a tree uh, that looks kind of like this. Now, each of these components has a price, okay? A price assigned to it. And what we would like to do is we would like to calculate the total price for that um, element, for that computer. Or individually, we want to calculate the price for the subtree. For example, the one we have here is the memory, right? So we want to calculate the memory price and then we want to calculate the computer price. And this is where the composite design pattern comes in because we can apply one uh, particular functionality, one um, calculation to the entire tree or to a sub tree uh, within that larger tree. So the composite design pattern allows us to structure objects into trees. Um, and then it works really well when the functionality uh, can be represented as a tree. So whenever we have this kind of structure, it can be a tree, it can be a graph, um, as long as we have a way of navigating that structure, then we can apply the composite pattern. We, it allows us to manipulate multiple objects as a single one. So for example, here, it allows us to either manipulate the entire uh, structure as one, as the computer, or if we want a sub uh, tree from that uh, larger one, we can manipulate the memory, for example, as a single element. All right, so that is the composite design pattern. I know this is kind of abstract, but let's go to our editor and start to implement an example of how this might work. So I'm going to create a new Python file here, and I'm gonna say composite. All right, now the first thing I need to do is I need to define a class equipment. And by the way, we will implement the structure that we uh, saw in the in the theoretical example, right? So we'll have a computer, memory, hard drive, processor, and so on. All of these are equipments, okay? So I'm going to define here an init that has a name of type string and a price of type int, okay? We're gonna limit our prices to integers. And let's just store self dot name and self dot price. And that's going to be price. Okay, so that is my, com my equipment. Now I'm going to create a class composite. Okay, let's define the init here. Now here I'm just going to provide a name for my composite self.name equals name. I'm also going to define a variable self.items is going to be an empty list, okay? So we're just going to store the items that this composite is made up of. And the composite can be uh, the computer that we talked about or can be the memory, basically the tree nodes, okay, in our example. So here um, I'm going to define an add function with a equipment of type equipment, okay? And I'm gonna say self.items.append my equipment. So we're gonna store it in our, um, in our equipment and then I'm going to return self, return self, okay? So we can kind of chain the operations uh, together. Now, I'm going to define here a at property, okay? And the property is going to be def price. Okay, we have self and then we can simply return a sum. I want to return the sum of the um, equipment 
elements, okay? So the sum of elements in this array, and I'm gonna have x dot price, okay, for x in self dot items, okay? So a list comprehension here, and we're going to sum everything together. Okay, now we have the price, and I'm gonna have a at price dot setter, and I'm going to define price of self and value, okay? Self dot price equals value, okay? So we're just going to store that uh, value here, that price value. Okay, so that's pretty much all we need to do, and we're going to simply define composites and add elements to it, add equipment to it. Okay, so let's create a main function, and here we have a computer, is going to be a composite. We need to provide a name, so I'm gonna say PC. And we're gonna have a processor that's going to be an equipment. Here I have my name processor and the price, let's say 1000. Okay, now um, I have my processor, let's define a uh, hard drive is going to be another equipment of a pros uh, sorry a uh, hard drive and this is going to cost 250 let's say um, we're going to need to define the memory now the memory is going to be another composite okay this is a node in a tree it's not a leaf yet in our structure so here we have memory and we have rom rom memory which is going to be an equipment of read-only memory. And let's say this is 100. And finally, we have RAM, which is going to be an equipment, random access memory. And that's going to cost 75. All right, so we have all the components. Now let's add them to, um, to create kind of the tree structure we're going to say mem equals memory dot add. We're going to add the ROM and dot add RAM. And then finally, the PC is going to be computer dot add. We're going to add the processor dot add hard drive dot add the memory. Okay, so that's pretty much all we need to do. And now since we have all the structure in place, we have the composite design pattern in place, we can simply say print pc.price. Okay, so the pc.price will basically calculate everything for us and just print out the price of this whole system. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And that is 1,425. Okay, so what you can see here is that we have uh, created our structure and we automatically ap apply one uh, functionality to the entire structure. We can apply the uh, price to memory or to the PC itself. Okay, so that is the composite design pattern. All right, the decorator pattern, also sometimes called the wrapper pattern, is another pattern that is quite easy to understand and really, really useful in practice. What it does is allows us to um, update or modify the behavior of a class that we do not have control over. So you can imagine a class that is part of a third party library that we cannot modify. However, we do want to alter its behavior slightly or perhaps add a bit more functionality than is currently available. In that case, we can use the decorator pattern to add that kind of personalization to that third party class. So in simple terms, it allows us to attach new behavior to an object that we do not control. Also, um, it allows us to do that without altering existing code. So of course, if the class is part of a library, we cannot modify it. So we want to be able to update it uh, without altering the code of the class. Um, when I say attach new behavior, I also mean, uh, so on the one hand, attach new behavior, but also modify existing behavior that 
doesn't really suit the current requirements. Overriding behavior. So changing existing behavior that um, is present in the class, but we want to update it for our current purposes. So to kind of give you a quick um, theoretical example, we can imagine here we have a network communication system where we have a lower layer TCP IP communication protocol. And let's say uh, as an example that TCP IP protocol has a send packet functionality. Okay, so that send packet functionality will not be enough for the purposes of our application. Okay, we want to communicate easily, uh, seamlessly with a uh, library, with a uh, an API, let's say. So we want to add some more functionality to this layer. So we can imagine that we can create a network communication layer where we have a send network message that uses the underlying send packet functionality. Okay, we have put a wrapper on top of this TCP IP. And we can actually keep going. We can create another layer that is, let's say, an API service that we can actually use in our code, in our application, where we can say something like retrieve API that will kind of hide the details of the implementation, but just give us the required functionality for our uh, code. Okay, so you can see how we can um, wrap or decorate lower layers, layers and lower functionality into um, more um, abstract and uh, more higher, let's say higher level functionality, okay, in kind of these layers. All right, so um, that is all for the theoretical introduction. Let's take a quick code example to kind of solidify um, how this works in practice. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new Python file here, and I'm going to call this decorator. Now, what I would like to do here is I would like to build a kind of an abstract example where we have a coffee machine that produces some coffee. And since we are, let's say, opening a coffee shop, we would like to have a bit more kind of fancy functionality where we create better coffees than just simple basic stuff. OK, so let's go ahead and implement that and see how it works. First of all, I would like to import from ABC import ABC and abstract method, okay? We want to create um, abstract functionality here. So first of all, class coffee machine that inherits from ABC. Now this will have two abstract methods. So first one, abstract method def make small coffee. Okay, I'm gonna have pass for now and another abstract method def make large coffee. Okay, again, we will pass. All right, so this is my abstract functionality. Now this, we're gonna say it's a third party library, we don't have access to it, okay? What we want to do is we want to wrap this coffee machine um, in another layer that uses the functionality that we've defined here, but also adds its own functionality or maybe um, overrides some behavior. Okay, so let's create a class basic coffee machine. Okay, um, here we will have a um, inherits from coffee machine here. All right, now this one will simply implement the uh, two abstract methods. So I'm going to have def make small coffee. Let me change that real quick. Small coffee. Now here I'm just going to print uh, basic coffee machine making small coffee. And then I would like to define a make large coffee print basic coffee machine making large coffee. All right, so this is the uh, implementation of my uh, abstract class. Now, uh, we would like to override this functionality. So let's say enhanced coffee machine that inherits from coffee machine. All right, so importantly here, if we're going to wrap this functionality, then we need to provide 
um, this object to my enhanced coffee machine. So I'm gonna have an init where I can pass basic machine of type basic coffee machine. Okay, and I'm going to store this self dot basic uh, machine equals basic machine. All right, so we have the object and this is going to be the wrapper on top of the object or the decorator of this basic coffee machine. So what I would like to do here, since we inherit from coffee machine, we need to implement the basic functionality. So def make small coffee. Now here we can simply use the functionality that the uh, initial object, the underlying object gives us. Okay, so for this example, we're not going to do anything special. We're just going to use self dot basic machine dot make small coffee. This is to kind of show you that we can have some functionality that is there and we're going to use it as it is in the lower layer. Now, if we want to override some functionality, we're going to override make large coffee self dot basic machine. Um, so for the large coffee, let's override the functionality, right? So instead of printing the uh, basic coffee machine message, we're going to print the enhanced coffee machine making large coffee. Okay, so that is the um, alteration. That's the change in functionality. Okay, we can see that it's different. We print a different message. Now we can also have um, added functionality. Okay, so we have same functionality, change functionality and added functionality. Let's say make milk coffee. Okay, so for milk coffee, we can use some of the underlying lower level functionality, but add our own. So here I'm going to have print enhanced coffee machine making milk coffee. Okay, we can use self dot basic coffee machine dot make small coffee. So we're using the functionality, but we're adding a bit more. So print line or print um, enhanced coffee machine, let's say adding milk. Okay, so we're uh, kind of wrapping this um, lower level functionality with our own custom one. Okay, so that is the example. Now let's move on to the main and call these functions. Okay, so here I'm going to have a basic machine is going to be equals basic coffee machine. And then the enhanced coffee enhanced machine is going to be enhanced coffee machine. And here, of course, we need to provide the basic machine. Okay, so we have the two. Now I'm going to call enhanced machine dot make small coffee. Um, let's just print line, uh, print one line here. Enhanced machine dot make large coffee. Print an empty line again. Okay, and then enhance machine dot make milk coffee. Okay, so that should call all the functionality that we have defined. So let me just run the decorator now. Now the first one simple uh, functionality that's defined in the lower level, um, updated functionality or overridden functionality. And then the final one is uh, kind of decorated. So we have some functionality before we call the lower level, um, class and then we add some of our own functionality afterwards. Okay, so we've kind of wrapped the existing functionality into our own code. All right, so hopefully that's clear. That is how uh, the decorator pattern works. In this video, we will talk about the facade pattern. Now, this is one of the most useful design patterns um, because what it does is it allows us to hide away some complexity and some uh, difficult to understand functionality behind a very simple interface. Okay, so let's have a look at what it is. 
Basically, it allows us to provide a simple interface to complex functionality. You might have a third party library that has some complex uh, working inner workings, or you might yourself develop a library that you want your clients to use. There is no reason for the client to understand all the complexity that goes around um, the functionality that you're trying to implement. What you're trying to do is simply provide a way to use that complexity. Okay, so you want to provide an easy interface, an easy facade to allow a client to use a particular um, system or a particular piece of code. And it removes the need for complex object or memory management. It The facade itself is not a simple interface. It is a, let's say, a class that provides some functionality. However, it manages all the complex uh, object or, or whatever memory or uh, data types or whatever it is. It manages that within your class and provides an easy way to access the underlying system. And it simplifies client implementation, of course, since the client doesn't need to understand how uh, the third party library works or how the system uh, that you're hiding behind the facade works, then the client is much simpler. And of course, this provides us with separation of concerns. Since the client doesn't need to know how you implement something, it just needs to know how to call that particular something. All right, so that is the quick introduction. Let's have a look at some code to see how this works in practice. So here, um, let me define a new or create a new Python file that's going to be called facade. All right, so what I would like to do here is I would like to create a kind of quote unquote simulated storage system um, and store some data, okay? Some, uh, in our case, it's gonna be some user data and we're gonna provide a facade for that user storage system that hides away the complexities of that implementation. All right, now here, uh, I'm gonna create a class complex system storage or store, complex system store. And we're going to define an init that takes a file path of type string. Now, a few variables here, self.filePath is going to be file path. Okay, this is where we're going to store the data in our system. Self.cache is going to be a dictionary. So we're gonna provide a caching functionality with this complex system store. And we're going to just print a message here. Let me just make that an F string, reading data from file. And here I have my file path. All right, now um, we're going to define a store functionality with a key of type string and a value of type string. And we're simply gonna say self.cache of key is going to be value. Okay, easy enough so far. Now let's define a read with a key of type string, and this will return um, self.cache of key. Okay, we're going to be able to read from that cache. And finally, def commit, we're going to have simply print line, an F string storing cached data to file, self.file. Uh, file path. Okay, so this is the complex system store and let's define the type of data that we will uh, be storing. I want to just add here at the top uh, from data classes import data class. Okay, so that we can define data classes in our code. So here I'm going to define a data class class user, and I'm just gonna have a login of type string. This is of course very um, kind of um, just an example for us. So I'm not going to put too much effort into uh, adding complexity. We can simply 
keep in mind that this is uh, a complex, quote unquote, complex system store, even though we haven't implemented much complexity here. This is a third party library, or it can be defined in our own application, but we just want to um, kind of shield the user from using such complexity and understanding the inner structure. Okay, so for that purpose, I'm gonna have a facade here. Um, for the facade, I'm going to define a class user repository. Okay, so the user repository will allow us to store users with our caching system on a file path. Okay, so class user repository. Here, I'm going to define my init. And let's say self.system underscore preferences is going to be a complex system store and let's give a file path. So something like data for slash default dot prefs. All right, so that is my init. Now let's define a save um, function where I have a user of type user. So I would like to be able to save this user on the complex system store. So self.systempreferences.store. I'm going to define a user underscore key and user.login. Okay, so I have stored this and I want to commit. So self.systempreferences.commit. Okay, and then finally we have fin uh, find first, okay, and here um, we want to retrieve a user. So here we will return user of self dot system preferences dot um, read, and I want to read my user key. Okay, so I'm just going to retrieve the first. We can imagine a system that stores multiple users. I want to just get the first one that is available and I read it with my key that I have defined. Of course, again, here we are simulating some um, real system. In reality, you would have a lot more complexity, complexity here, obviously, but we're just going to limit it to this. So um, main, here we want to just use our facade to store and retrieve our user. So user underscore repo is going to be a user repository. Okay, we're using the facade and we will have a user that say John. Okay, so we're just going to store and retrieve this user in our repository. So user repo dot save my current user. So I have saved it in my repository and I now I want to retrieve it. So retrieved user is going to be user repo dot find first that just retrieved my user and I can just print my retrieved user dot login. It should be the same as the one we defined here. All right, so that is my functionality. That is my facade. You can see in my main system, in my uh, client uh, code, I am only using the facade. I am not actually using the complex system store that is hidden behind my user repository facade. So let's go ahead and run this code. And we can see, first of all, reading data from file default preferences. This is the um, init function. Then storing cache data to file. Okay, that is the commit functionality. And then we are retrieving the user. And just to confirm that we have retrieved the right user, we are printing the, lo the login and we have John that we have defined here. So that is how um, on a very high level you implement the facade. All right, so let's talk about the flyweight design pattern. The flyweight design pattern, as its name suggests, is all about reducing the um, load or the requirements on a system. So for example, on a memory system, it reduces the amount of stuff that you store in memory. In a processing system, it reduces the amount of processing that you might want to do. That is where the name flyweight comes. 
from. So let's have a look at a quick kind of uh, abstract example to give you an idea of how this works. So let's say we have a system that has some limited memory capacity, right? Um, let's assume we are in some sort of game where we want to produce elements on a screen and we want to display them. So one kind of naive implementation would be to uh, create as many objects as we require and store them in memory as they come up, okay? And remove them as they get destroyed. So you can think about a kind of a war game where you have soldiers that come up on the, um, on the screen and you want to store every single soldier, you want to store them in memory when they are visible. Okay, so that is how this might look, but of course this is kind of an inefficient way to go about it because that will fill up the screen quite quickly, okay? A better implementation would be to have some sort of shape factory or kind of character factory or element or whatever um, that simply produces elements that are required, that are unique, and then you use those elements in memory um, as um, a more efficient solution, right? We don't want to create the same functionality over and over again. We just want to display it whenever we have, whenever we require and just store it in one place as a single entity. Now, of course, this doesn't work for everything. So if we, if we take the example of our war game, um, you could store the sprites uh, that are required to display the elements. You could store them in a factory. However, you might want to have elements for every single uh, quote-unquote soldier or character on the screen. You have unique information re uh, related to that character. So for example, the direction where they're moving or whether they are firing or hiding or whatever it is, the state of that element, you still have to uniquely store it for that particular character. However, the stuff that you can store um, in the stuff in common, like the sprites, you can and should store them in a central location. So that is where the flyweight um, design pattern comes in. It works when you have a lot of similar objects that can share some functionality. The functionality that they share can be unique, okay? The functionality that you cannot share has to be individual for each individual element. It allows us to reduce memory footprint in our example, but it also allows us to remove, um, to reduce processing uh, footprint, right? You don't have to kind of retrieve from memory and process those sprites over and over again. You just have them already uh, ready to go and just grab them whenever you need to. And of course, it um, allows us to improve efficiency. We don't want to, if we have a large um, amount of elements in memory, retrieving them and displaying them and, um, you know, updating them uh, does take a lot of time. So efficiency is uh, quite important as well. Okay, so flyweight helps with all of that. All right, so that is all for the uh, theoretical introduction. Let's have a look at some code. And I would like to implement here a system where we have some sprites and some characters um, that have different ranks. Okay, we have we saw the example of three types of elements. We're going to implement three types of characters in our code. So let's go and create a new Python file and I'm gonna call this flyweight. All right, and first of all, I'm going to import random. We're going to need this uh, to create some random characters and I'm going to import from ABC, import ABC and abstract method. Okay, just to create abstract classes. So first of all, we're gonna have a class sprite with ABC and here we will have an abstract method that we can define as draw. Okay, pass for now. And then we're going to have an ab another abstract method, define move. And we're going to provide the coordinates, x of type int and y of type int. And here we're going to pass again for now. Right, so let's define a class fighter rank. Okay, so we're gonna have three types of fighters. Um, let me just spell that correctly. 
three types of fighters in our code. We're gonna have a private, let's give it the value zero. We're gonna have a sergeant value one, and we're gonna have, let's say major value two. Okay, so these are the types of fighters and let's create a class fighter um, with a, that inherits from Sprite. All right, so um, here we're going to define, first of all, our init or override our init. We're going to pass the rank. Okay, and we're going to store that self dot rank equals rank. All right, so uh, let's implement the fighter. This is a sprite, so we need to override these two methods. So first of all, draw. For the draw, we're simply going to print a message, um, an F string drawing fighter. And I'm gonna have the self here. And for the move method, we're also going to print an F string Okay, and here moving fighter um, self to position x comma y. Okay, so very uh, kind of abstract implementation, but it gives us the uh, kind of picture of how this might work. Now let's define a class fighter factory um, that will allow us to create fighters. So first of all, let's override the init. And here we're going to just have a self.fighters is an empty array. And we're going to have a function get fighter with um, where we provide the rank of type fighter rank. All right, so um, here we're only going to store three types of three actual fighters, one for each type, okay? So first of all, we're gonna say f equals self dot fighters of rank. Okay, so we're going to try to retrieve the fighter with that particular rank. Now we're gonna say if not f, so if is if uh, we don't have one, then we're going to create it. F equals fighter of our rank. And we're going to store it for later use. So self dot fighters of rank equals F. Okay, and then finally we will return F. So again, here we have our fighters. The fighters will eventually have only three elements, one for each rank that we have. All right, so that is pretty much it. Now let's create a class army, okay, with a self.army is an array. Uh, sorry, just define the variable here. We don't need self. Now um, I'm going to define spawn fighter with a rank of type fighter rank. And here we're gonna say self.army.append. Um, now keep in mind that this will not contain unique fighters. They will just contain the ones that we have here. Okay, so uh, here we have fighter of rank. Okay, so we're adding fighters to our army. And then finally, def draw army. Okay, and for fighter in self.army, we're going to say if fighter.rank equals fighter rank dot, let's say major, then we're gonna say print, um, I'm gonna print an M and I'm going to find the end equals empty string so that everything gets printed on a single line. Elif fighter dot rank equals fighter rank dot sergeant. In that case, I'm going to print S space with an end empty string and then else print a P space with an end 
empty string. Okay, so our army will be printed on a single line. All right, now um, we have our main, okay? And army underscore size is going to be, let's say 1000 to start with. Then army equals army. Okay, so define or instantiate the object. And here for i in range of uh, army size, okay, r equals random dot um, rand, what is it, rand range, uh, rand range, range, hard to pronounce that. Um, here we have three. So since we have zero, one, and two, as a as fighter rank zero one and two we can get a random uh, number from here and then we can say army dot spawn fighter with our r and then finally we just need to say army dot draw army okay so hopefully that will work if i haven't made any mistake typing let's go ahead and run this and then we get our army so we have private, sergeant, and we have major. Okay, so we can see here that um, this is quite efficient, obviously, even if we created individual objects for each one, um, you know, we have 1000 elements, it's not that many, but um, in a real system where each element does have to store some local state, um, this is much more efficient. So everything that we can share between the elements we want to share it as much as possible and we do that in our case in the uh, factory okay where we have only three types of fighters but we just create as many as we uh, require for our army okay this is the shared functionality and we can actually increase this to um, let me just comment this out and if i put army size equals one million we can actually run this as well. It just takes a bit of time and then it just displays everything. Okay, so again, for a modern system, this is a very uh, quick program, but in reality where we have um, many, many elements on a screen, um, we can think of a game, but there are other situations where we might have that. This is uh, a way to reduce the memory and processing footprint. In this video, we will talk about the proxy design pattern. Now, the proxy design pattern will allow us to have an interface um, or um, kind of an object in front of an existing object in our code. The point of the proxy is to uh, kind of manage the life cycle and the access to the underlying object. Now, why we, uh, might we want to do that? Let's take a quick example. Let's say we have a disk management system that let's say might take quite a bit of time um, to access the functionality underneath, to access files, to retrieve them, to store them, uh, update them and so on. And let's say we have a bunch of clients that are trying to access the disk uh, more or less at the same time, you know, creating files, writing, uh, reading and so on. So immediately you might see a few problems with the system. First of all, uh, since the disk takes a bit of time to retrieve the information required, all the clients accessing the disk at the same time might overload the system and lead to a lot of delays. Furthermore, accessing the same file at the same time from multiple clients might lead to inconsistencies in that file. If we're trying to write at the, uh, on the same file at the same time, then that might cause a problem. So one of these solutions might be to implement a disk proxy in front of our disk. Okay, so this disk proxy might provide some, let's say, caching functionality to try to speed up the um, the system, right? So if multiple clients are trying to read the same file uh, at the same time or subsequently, then we might provide the caching ver the cached version of that file rather than accessing the disk every single time. Also, we might provide some sequencing operations where 
if we're trying to write the same file at the same time, the disk proxy might make sure that the written file is consistent. Okay, so the sequencing is quite important and we want to remove that from that disk since the disk might already be doing a lot of processing um, to access to retrieve the information. All right, so the proxy in brief just provides some functionality before or after calling an object. So we might want to provide functionality before, after, or instead of the uh, underlying object. Um, importantly for the proxy, it provides the same interface as the original object. So here, the accessing system, so in our case, the clients, do not actually know they are talking to a proxy rather than the disk, and they actually don't care, okay? As long as the information is consistent, the proxy might just, um, you know, they might access the proxy instead of the real disk without actually realizing it. Now, there's a couple of similarities uh, with uh, other design patterns. So the proxy pattern is quite similar to a few other patterns, but there are some, there are some uh, important differences. First of all, the proxy is quite similar to the facade design pattern. The important difference here is that while um, in the facade we provide a simple interface to a complex system, the proxy has the exact same interface as the object that it is um, kind of hiding, right? So the clients in the proxy case do not actually know they are not talking to the actual object. They think since there is the there's they are accessing the same interface, then they think they are talking to the real object, even though they are not. In the facade, they know. Uh, or they're actually accessing an interface that is a simplification of the functionality underneath. In addition to that, we have a, a similarity with the decorator pattern. So as we've seen, the decorator pattern can also override, can also um, replace the functionality underneath. The difference here is that the proxy manages the lifecycle of the object that it is hiding, okay? Whereas the decorator simply replaces some functionality or adds its own before or after, the proxy actually um, uses the underlying object every single time and manages the life cycle of its object. So quite a, a subtle difference, but an important one. All right, so with that said, let's move to our code and create a, uh, or write an example uh, for the proxy pattern. So let's create a new file called proxy. And what I would like to do here is I would like to have um, a image object that might um, take some time to display. And I would like to have a proxy image that adds some uh, functionality on top of it. Maybe something similar to caching the image. All right, so um, I'm going to first of all import from ABC, import ABC and abstract method. Uh, sorry, ABC and abstract method. Okay, and I'm going to define a class image with ABC and abstract method def display. Okay, and I'm going to pass for now. So the uh, image, the object underneath is going to be an image and we're going to call that real image, which is a type of image. Okay, and here let's define or override the init first where we provide a file name of type string, self.filename equals file name and Let's print a message, real image, loading, and we have our file name here. Okay, in addition to that, let's define a display, um, or rather override the display uh, from the uh, abstract class. And here we're going to print again an F string, real image displaying, displaying self dot file name. Okay, um, I'm going to just add an end with 
two lines here just to kind of have a bit of separation there when we actually display the image. All right, so um, let's define here a proxy image that is also an image, okay? Proxy image will have an init that has the same signature as the other one. So we have a file name of type string. We will store self dot file name equals file name. And we also want to store self dot real image is none for now. Okay, so we have our proxy image. Of course, we need to implement the display. And again, here we have the same signature, but the functionality will be quite different. So first of all, let's print a f string proxy image displaying. And here we have self.filename. Okay. If not um, self.real image, so if we don't have anything stored there, then we can simply print from disk, okay? We are retrieving the actual information for the image from the disk and we say self.realImage equals real image of self, without the quotes, self.filename, okay? However, else we will print from cache. Okay, so if we have accessed this before, we just display it from the cache. And what we want to do here, we say self.realImage.display. Okay, so a very basic caching functionality. All right, so that is all we need to do. We have implemented our proxy. We just need to call everything we need. So first of all, image is going to be proxy image. Okay, let's say test.jpg. Okay, now here, first of all, uh, let me put a comment, load image from disk. Okay, and we say image.display. Then the second time we call that, we will say load image from cache. Okay, and we will get the confirmation when we actually run the code, since uh, we will print out the correct information in the code. So let's go ahead and run our proxy. The first time we run this, we get proxy image displaying, we get it from the disk, uh, real image loading and real image displaying. However, the second time we run, we get proxy image test, that is standard, but we will get it from cache this time. We are no longer loading because we have it loaded already and we are just displaying it. So you can see it's faster the functionality is more efficient. Of course, we are just simulating here. We're just displaying a message, but you can imagine loading image, an image from um, the disk or let's say from a uh, an API might take quite a bit of time. So this, um, this printout here in reality in a real world system might take quite a bit of time and we just remove it. Uh, remove the necessity for it when we are displaying the image for a second time. So that is the uh, use of the proxy design pattern. All right, in this video, we are talking about the chain of responsibility design pattern. So we're going to start with a quick diagram to show you what uh, kind of conceptually high level what this uh, design pattern is about. So here we have a chain of handlers, which are classes or objects or components that can handle a specific request. So what we do here is we pass some sort of request to one of the handlers. The handler will process that request in some way, and then it has two options. First of all, it has a link to the next handler in the chain. So it could pass the request down the chain, or it has the option to kind of quote unquote, consume that request and return a result, thus skipping the rest of the chain. And if the request moves on to the next handler, the next handler does the same thing, either processes it and consumes it, or simply hands it over to the next handler, depending on the logic that is implemented in that particular handler. Okay, so you will find this uh, pattern quite often 
in various systems where you have multiple components in your system that can handle a specific request. So to kind of sum up, we define a chain of handlers to process a request. Each handler contains a reference to the next handler. So we can pass that request to the next one. And that is how we actually create the chain. Okay, each handler moves the request down to the next handler. The handler decides whether or not to process the request. Okay, it has the, it has the option to skip it entirely. It has the option to consume the request and return a result, or it has the option to do some processing and pass it on to the next handler in the chain. And then we can have different types of requests. So we can have some requests that start from the beginning of the chain and move down all the way to the end. We can have requests that start somewhere in the middle of the chain and then go forward with the next um, elements in that chain. Okay, various types of requests, various types of handlers. All right, so that is the introduction to the pattern. Let's go ahead and implement a uh, an example here in code. So let's create a file chain of responsibility. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to implement a system that can add, uh, we're going to assume that we pass some network request to our chain and our chain consists of handlers that can add headers to that network request. So we're going to have, for example, an authentication header. We're going to have uh, some body payload header and so on, right? So each header can have the option to add something to that request. All right, so first of all, let's import some uh, elements from underscore underscore future import annotations. Okay, this is because I would like to use some classes in a random order, maybe before they are defined. And then from ABC, import ABC and abstract method. Right, so first of all, let's define our handler chain class. Okay, this inherits from ABC. And here we're going to override the init method to provide an input header as a parameter. And this is going to be a handler chain. Okay, um, and here self dot um, in, sorry, next header is going to be the input header. Let me just type that, uh, spell that correctly. Input header. Right, so let's define an abstract method, def add header with an input header of type string. We're going to pass, and then we're going to define a do underscore next um, method with an input header of type string. Okay, so the input header is basically where we add our functionality, our uh, data for this particular header. So um, here we can say if self dot next header, if we have a next header, then we will return, uh, we will pass it on. So we will return self dot next header dot add header with input header and then return input header. So if we don't have a next header, we just return the result. If we have one, then we invoke the add header with the information that we have here. All right, so um, let's define a class and here we're going to implement some um, handlers, okay? So um, we're gonna have authentication header with uh, that inherits from handler chain. That's gonna be part of the handler chains. And we're going to define an init method with a token of type string. And we're going to provide the next header of type handler chain. We're gonna have none by default. Okay, so we're going to first invoke the super method dot init with handler chain. 
with uh, next header, that's the name. Okay, and then we're going to say self.token is going to be equal to token. All right, so that is the um, instantiation. So we're going to implement the add header method. And here we can simply say h equals an f string, input in curly brackets, input header. So what we have already received slash n, and here we're gonna have authorization colon self dot token. Okay, so we're just adding our information to the existing header, and we're going to return self dot do next with h. Okay, so that is the authentication header. Let's create another one. We're going to have content type header. Okay, this is also part of our handler chain. Um, again, we're going to have our init method. And here we're going to pass some parameters, content type of type string. And of course, next header of type handler chain that's none by default. Okay, let me just make some space here. Right, so for the init, it's very similar. We're going to add uh, the super call and then self dot content type equals content type. Right, so now we have to implement the add header method. And here we just add our content type information to the header. So h equals an f string with our input header. Okay, slash n content type one word colon space self dot content type. And then we're going to say self, uh, sorry, return self dot do next with h. Okay, and just for fun, so that we can have three handlers, let's add another one, class. And here we have body payload header, right? With it, which is a handler chain as well. Very similar, um, I'm going to override the init method. And here we're going to pass the body of type string and next header of type handler chain is none by default. The super method call and then self dot body equals body. Okay, um, now the add header, that's gonna be slightly different from the others. Here we're gonna have h is an f string with input header and we're gonna have forward slash n and here we just put the self dot body. Okay, this is not a, um, a header anymore. This is the body of the request. And then we can return self.do next with h. All right, so hopefully that um, is enough. So now we have three elements. We need to um, instantiate them and arrange them in a chain and then call some requests on them. So let's implement the main authorization header is going to be authentication or we should call this authentication even though the header itself is um, authorization the class is called authentication okay authentication header and here we can pass some information some token one two three four five six this is our authentication token then content type header is going to be is going to be content type header with um, let's say JSON okay body header is going to be body payload header and here we have some JSON so let's say body colon and curly bracket let's escape the quote Let's say username, escape a quote, colon, uh, not, not colon, equals, escape a quote, and let's say John, and final escape quote. All right, so we have our three headers. We need to arrange them in a chain. So authentication header dot 
next header is going to be the content type header and content type header dot next header is going to be the body header. Right, so we have our chain. Now we need um, a couple of requests. So we're gonna have one request that goes through the whole chain from authentication to content type to body. And then a second request, which skips the authentication and just goes through content type and body. Okay, so we're gonna say message with authentication is going to be equal to authentication header dot um, add header for the message header with authentication. Okay, and we're gonna have message without authentication equals, so we're not gonna call authentication header, but we're gonna call content type header dot add header to header without authentication. All right, so that's all for now. And we just need to print the message with authentication. I'm gonna print an empty line here, and then we're gonna go print message without authentication. So let's see if I haven't made any mistake typing that, I'm going to run this. And then the first one is gonna be header with authentication. So we'll get authorization, content type, and body. I forgot a curly bracket for the body here. Okay, right, so I have the curly bracket. And then without authentication, we get JSON and the body. So you can see here that all these messages go through the chain. Um, all the headers that we implemented will process the request and then pass it on to the next header until we reach the end. And we know that we reach the end here because we don't have a next header, so we just return the result. Also, here we have one um, request that goes through the entire chain and we have another request that goes through only part of the chain because this one for whatever reason doesn't require authentication. So that is the chain of responsibility design pattern. Right, so the next design pattern we're gonna talk about is the command design pattern. So let's have a look at a diagram, a high level overview to see what um, kind of overall problem the command design pattern is trying to help us solve. So here we have a system that contains two parts. We have a GUI or graphical user interface and we have some business logic. Right? The GUI will be made up of some components, a few buttons, some text fields, sliders, and so on and so forth. Right? Now, each of these um, components on the GUI side will want to interact with the business logic. There is a, a separation of concerns there. The GUI takes input from the user and invokes some uh, requests, some functionality on the business logic. So that means this particular button will invoke some functionality here. The other button that we have will invoke some other functionality. The text field, let's say when it's updated, will let the business logic know and so on. So all of these will call their respective functions on the business logic side. So immediately you can see a problem with this and that is the tight coupling between the GUI and the business logic. Right, so all the components here need to know exactly which function to invoke on the business logic side. This leads to tight coupling, which leads to low usability and a host of other issues, right? Like testing and so on. So of course we uh, want to solve this problem and we can uh, solve it by introducing another layer between the two and that is the command. So the command will simply take all the information from the graphical side in our case, we'll package that in some standard form and it will pass it to the business logic. So immediately you can see here that there's no more, uh, there's no longer a connection between the UI and the business logic. Everything goes through the command and the command kind of package will go to the business logic and will get processed. Right, so the request is wrapped in an object that contains all the required information and based on that information, 
it can be later processed on the business logic. The command object is passed to the correct handler. So in our case, in this small example, we have a business logic layer that can handle commands, but obviously in a real world situation, we can have multiple components on the backend side that can all handle different commands. So the commands will be passed to the relevant business logic side, or we can also have multiple servers of business logic and we can have um, some sort of load balancer that sends commands to various servers to kind of um, make the system more efficient. Right um, now, benefits obviously include decoupling as we've seen, but there are many other benefits such as efficiency. Um, we can introduce some ordering if we require. Okay, so um, in our case, we have UI commands, but in a real world situation, we can pass any type, we can package any type of information into an object that can then be processed into a command that can then be processed. So we can, um, implement some sort of ordering or some priority for the commands, okay? All this is uh, possible once we encapsulate this information. Otherwise, um, you know, calling the methods directly simply won't allow us to do that. All right, so that is the uh, theoretical introduction. Let's have a look at some code um, to see how we implement this in practice. So here we can create a new Python file command, right? So what I would like to do here is I would like to implement um, a, um, let's say a restaurant or some sort of ordering system that can um, package the information in a, the ordering information um, in a command and pass it on to some sort of processor for processing, right? So it's gonna be obviously very abstract. We're just gonna print some information, but the logic behind it is gonna be sound. So first of all, from ABC import ABC and abstract method. Okay, and let's add the class command. Now the command will be will inherit from ABC and we're going to override the init method where we pass a command ID of type int and we're gonna store that. So self dot command ID equals command ID. And we're gonna have an abstract method where we define an execute and here we will simply pass. Okay, so we have the command ID and we have a way to execute it. That is our um, command object. Now, let's go ahead and implement a class order add command, which is going to be a command. And we're gonna override the execute method. Here we simply print a message. Let's add an F string, adding order with ID self dot command id okay we're going to assume that this actually executes the command that we have here and then we're going to have an a class order pay command okay command this can be um, an online shopping system or a restaurant or whatever it is and here we will override the execute so importantly all the commands will execute in the similar in a similar way, right? So um, that will allow us to kind of implement this, um, let's say, ordering or priority system. Okay, so here I'm going to print an f string, uh, paying for order with ID self dot command ID. Right, so um, we have our orders. We're gonna limit ourselves to two order types, two kinds of commands. So I'm gonna have a class and let's call this command processor. Okay, and we're gonna just define a class variable. Let me make some space here. A class variable called Q. Okay, an empty array. And we're gonna have an add to Q of self and command of type command. Okay, self.q.append, 
our command. So we're going to add the command and then we're going to process them. So def process commands. Okay. And we're going to have just a list comprehension here, item dot execute for item in self dot Q. Okay. And then we're going to importantly set the queue um, to an empty array. So reset those commands because they have been processed. So that's pretty much all we need to do. Um, now let's go ahead in main, let's go ahead and create some commands and execute them. So first of all, I'm going to have my processor equals command processor and let's add some commands. So processor dot add to queue here. We're going to have a order add command with order one, duplicate that and order two. And so I have added two orders. Now let's pay for two orders. So processor dot add to queue. Um, what's the name? Order pay command of one and duplicate that and two. All right. So that's it. And then we can simply call processor dot process process commands. All right. Let me just remove all the white spaces here. Right. So, um, that is all there is to it. So we have our queue and we have the execution. So let's go ahead and run this. Right. So we have adding order with ID one, adding order with ID two, then paying for order one and paying for order two. So you can see here how we encapsulate that, um, information, that requirement into a command class and we pass that command class to processor. Okay. Processor handles commands. It doesn't really care which kinds of commands it just calls execute. So you can kind of imagine here, we can implement um, a lot more complexity if our system requires it, where we order some commands, we execute them in a certain order. We balance them across multiple servers if you require and so on and so forth. The interpreter design pattern is a pattern that's very useful when we're trying to have a system that can quote unquote understand or process a language. Now languages don't have to be, you know, human languages. They have, they can be mathematical languages or some sort of programming system. Um, however, the interpreter allows us to move through uh, a quote unquote sentence in that language and understand it and do some processing on it. Now, this sounds a bit abstract, so let's start with an example. Let's say we have um, a, a mathematical, um, you know, equation, right? So five plus three, whatever that is. We have um, four main symbols here, plus multiply, divide, and we have minus as well, although it's not included here. And we want a system that can kind of understand this uh, expression. Okay. So it can allow for the flexibility of algebraic equations using only these four symbols. So how do we do that? Um, we have, we can build a kind of a tree uh, from these expressions. So first one is going to be, for example, here, we're going to take the last symbol that is a division and add the two components of it. On the left side, we have another tree. On the right side, we have the number five. Now on the left side, we can take the symbol multiplication and have a binary tree there as well. On the left side, we have some expression. On the right side, we have the number two. Okay, so if we take the left side again, we have a plus symbol. On the left side, we no longer have an expression. We have a, um, this should be five, right? Five here, that's my mistake. But on the right side, we have the number three. So we build this tree, this binary tree with this expression that we were provided. And then we can have the system go through that tree in a binary way and calculate the result. Okay, so um, this is kind of an example, but this works very well with any other uh, kind of quote unquote language, right? So we recursively evaluate grammar and expressions. Grammars in this case is going to be the symbols and expressions are going to be the numbers. 
Um, this works for parsing systems, for processing engines. So uh, if you're trying to understand um, the best example is a mathematical equation, a processing system that can cope with that will use an interpreter pattern. We have two main components in our pattern. One is going to be a terminal expression, which in our case are the numbers. Okay, these are terminal. And we also have non-terminal, which in our case will be these four symbols or three in the case of this particular equation. So terminal and non-terminal expressions. All right, so that is the introduction. Let's have a look at a, a piece of code to see how this works in practice. So I am here in, um, in our editor and I'm going to create an interpreter file. And first of all, I'm going to define an abstract expression. That's going to be a class. It will have a static method. Okay, and it will define an interpret that will simply pass for now. Okay, so we have expressions, right? Abstract expression. Now we're going to define two types of expressions. One are going to be terminal and the other are going to be non-terminal. So first of all, terminal expressions or expression, because that's going to have a class. Now in our case, the terminal expression is going to be the number, which is going to inherit from abstract expression. So let's define Let's override the init method and pass the value here for our number self dot value is going to be now let's convert this to float since our expression uh, will be able to give us floats, right? If we have division, then we can probably assume that at some point we'll have float values, right? So this is the number. Now let's define an interpret or override the interpret and of course, I need self here. And I'm going to return self.value. Right, so um, that is the terminal expression. Now let's define non-terminal expression. And that is going to be class algebra or algebraic. Let's call it algebra for short expression. Algebra expression is going to be an abstract expression we're going to override the init method. Okay, um, here we have two parameters, left and right. Okay, so let's just store that. Self.left is going to be left and self.right is going to be right. Now we're not gonna add the interpret here because we will um, override that since it comes from abstract expression. We'll override that when we um, implement classes that extend from algebra expression, which we're going to do now. So we're going to have class add, um, which is an algebra expression. Okay, and we're going to define interpret with self. And here um, we will have return self dot left dot interpret plus self dot right dot interpret. Okay, so um, that is the add, very, very simple. So we allow the left expression to interpret and the right expression to interpret as well. Often we will get the right expression is gonna be just a number, which interpreted will just return the actual value. However, the left expression will require, um, you know, um, recursive calls for this interpret. All right, so that is add. Now let's add subtract with algebra expression. And we're going to define interpret here. And we will return self.left.interpret minus self.right.interpret. Okay, very, very simple. Um, we're going to have class um, multiply algebra expression. And actually, I'm just going to copy this and paste it here. And I'm going to have here multiplication. And then finally, class 
um, divide algebra expression and I will paste that and make sure we change the symbol division. Okay, so these are my four algebra expression or algebraic expressions. Um, so that's pretty much all we need to do. Uh, now let's just go ahead and implement the main. The main will kind of contain a bit more information. Okay, so let's have um, a target expression here. That's going to be, let's say three plus five. Make sure you put the spaces in. Um, I've set this requirement so that it's easier for us to kind of break down this expression into symbols, right? So um, space after, before and after every symbol, whether it's a uh, number or a actual symbol. So uh, three plus five minus two multiplied by seven div divided by um, five, let's say plus 11. Okay, whatever you want the expression to be, it doesn't really matter. Now, we have our tokens, which is going to be target.split, split by a space. Okay, so this will give us a list of tokens. And we have expressions is an empty array. Now, for i in range of length of tokens, Okay, now here, if i equals zero, if we reach the end, we can say expressions dot append our, um, this is going to be a number. So we know that always at the beginning we have a number. So we can just add it to our expressions, tokens of i. We can put tokens dot zero here, it doesn't really matter. Any case, l if, um, tokens of i equals plus, okay? So if it's a plus, then we say expressions.append. Here we have an add expression, okay? Now we have expressions.pop and the right side is going to be a number of tokens of i plus one. Okay, so we know that after each, let me put a colon here, after each um, actual algebra token, we have a number, so we can just add it there. Okay, then L if tokens of i is going to be minus. Okay, we can do the exact same thing. So let me just copy and paste that, except this is a subtract. Okay, let me make sure we haven't made any mistake. I think it's fine. Then L if tokens of i equals multiplication, then we have instead of add, we have multiply. And then we have L if tokens of i equals division. Um, we need some quotes there. Okay, then we have divide. Right, so we have all the information. We have constructed our expression, so we can just call. Result is going to be equals expressions dot pop dot interpret. Okay, and then we can hopefully print the result here if we haven't made any mistakes. So I think that is all there is to it. Um, let's run this code and see if it works fine. Yes, 19.4, so that works fine. Um, now, there might be some um, edge cases which I haven't verified. So for example, if we just provide a target of a single number, um, you can check that. But the main idea here is uh, that the uh, if we provide this kind of expression in a certain format, an algebraic expression, this interpreter pattern will go through it recursively, build the expressions that we've defined and apply the interpret function to each one recursively and give us the final result. Okay, so hopefully you see how um, the interpreter pattern works. All right, next on our list is the iterator pattern. Now, 
To be fair, if you've been a developer for more than five minutes, you've probably already used iterator in your code. Okay, so you probably already know what the iterator is. I have included it here for completeness, but also because I want to show you an example of how you might implement it yourself if you want to, if you have a requirement for it, right? So an iterator is basically a way to, tra to traverse a collection, to go element by element and apply some functionality to it or simply return it for whatever purpose. It has two methods. First is going to be the has next, which will return a Boolean on whether or not there is anything more in that collection. And then next will actually move to the next element and retrieve and return that element. Okay, so very, very simple, very intuitive. We already know how this works, but let's go ahead and implement an example and see it in practice. So I'm going to create a new Python file here and I'm gonna call this iterator. Right, now what I would like to do here is I would like to have a, um, a functionality, a couple of classes, a couple of iterators that will scroll, will, uh, sorry, will traverse a collection of words and will return them either in an alphabetical order or in a reverse alphabetical order. Now, of course, you could do this very, very easily uh, with um, functions on a collection. Uh, the point here is not to reinvent the wheel, it is to show you how you might implement that if you choose to do that for whatever reason, right? So class um, alphabetical order iterator. Okay, now let's define or rather override the init method and provide the words here as a collection and then reverse of type Boolean and by default, that's going to be false. Okay, so um, we're going to have self.collection is going to be equal to sorted of words. So we're gonna sort the words um, in our collection and then self.reverse is going to be reverse. Okay, and we're gonna also store self.position is going to be length of words minus one if reverse else zero. So we're either going to start at zero or at the last element. Okay, so let's implement the two methods. First, we're gonna have next and here we'll have value equals self.collection of self.position and then self dot position plus equals minus one if self dot reverse else one. So depending on uh, which way we go, we either go back or we go forwards. Okay, and then we'll simply return value. Very simple. Now let's define has next. Okay, and here we can say if self.reverse and self.position greater than minus one, return true, elif not self.reverse and self.position smaller than length of self.collection, Okay, and in this case, return true, else return false. Okay, so um, we're just trying to see if there is any element um, that is after the current one. Right, so um, very simple, very intuitive. Now let's define a class words collection and we're going to override the init method here with a collection and we're going to say self dot collection equals collection. And then we have def get iterator. And here we will return alphabetical order iterator with self and um, self dot collection. 
Okay. Um, so this is the alphabetical order. Now let's define get reverse iterator. And we will, of course, return the reverse one. So return alphabetical order iterator with self, self.collection. Um, sorry, we don't need to pass the self. I don't know why I put that here. Right, and same for here. Right, so self.collection, and then here we have true. Okay, so the reverse iterator is true. Right, so we have main, um, and here let's create our collection. So collection is going to be words collection of, let's have some words, John, Alice, um, we have Michael, and maybe Carol. Okay, so um, random order. Now, iterator is going to be collection dot get iterator and reverse iterator is going to be collection dot get reverse iterator. Right, so let's um, print out some elements while iterator dot has next. Okay, in this case, we're just going to print iterator dot next and Let's print out a empty line here, and then we're gonna say while iterator, sorry, reverse iterator dot has next. We're going to print the iterator, sorry, the reverse iterator dot next. Okay, so now if I have if I haven't made any mistakes, we should be able to see the Result, now here I need to provide a collection. That's my mistake. Now let's go ahead and run this again and then we have our result. So the first one is going to be um, alphabetical order and then for the second iterator is going to be reverse alphabetical order. So that is how you might implement an iterator in your own code. All right, in this video, we're going to talk about the mediator pattern. So the mediator pattern is very useful when we have multiple components in our system that kind of individually do their own thing, do their own processing, and then need to communicate with each other. Okay, so you can think about a distributed system where various nodes communicate with each other directly, right? So we want to have this kind of communication. Now, of course, in a system, when uh, the nodes or the uh, distributed components communicate directly with each other, it means that they have to know about each other, right? They have to know how to contact every other component that they need access to. So this is obviously a problem, especially when the system grows and when we have um, dozens, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of nodes, right? You can think about a chat application where we have millions of users that need to be able to communicate with each other. They need to know how to contact each other. In a chat application, a uh, for example, your phone doesn't talk directly to another phone. What it does is it talks to a central server and then that server relays the message to the required destination. So this is the mediator pattern. You want to have a central location where each client communicates or sends their message to only one destination. And then that destination based on that message will forward it um, to the, um, you know, to the appropriate node. Okay, so that is the mediator, mediator pattern. It provides a central object that is used for communicating between objects. We've talked about, um, you know, chat applications, but also this can be used in larger applications with various components or let's say microservices or things like that. Components that need to communicate with each other and share information should uh, have a central location where those messages are being sent. The objects don't talk to each other, they talk to the mediator, and this obviously reduces dependencies between objects. The objects no longer need to know how to reach every other individual node in the system, they just know how to reach the mediator, and then the mediator will forward the message to the 
uh, final destination, right? So very uh, simple, very intuitive. Now let's implement a, um, a system, a program to kind of see how this works in practice. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new Python file here called mediator. And here we're going to have a very basic chat system or rather group chat system where each user can send a message to all other users, right? So we'll see how that works. Now, first of all, I need to import from future import um, annotations, okay? I want to be able to call uh, or reference classes before I define them. So here I have a chat user class, okay? I'm going to have a mediator variable that's none by default and let's initialize the element or override the init method and provide a name as a string right so self.name equals name all right so let's implement the method set underscore mediator and here we have m uh, e d mediator Okay, which which we haven't defined yet, but we will. No worries. Now, um, self dot mediator is going to be mediator, or rather med, as I've defined it here. All right. Now um, we need a send method, which will have a message of type string, and we're going to just print a f string that says self dot name. Um, colon sending message msg okay so that is the send message and we're going to say self dot mediator dot send underscore message which is a function that we will define at some point msg and self okay and finally we need a def receive with self and msg of type string so this is where we receive the message and we just want to print line an f string with self dot name colon receiving message msg all right so um, that is our chat user now let's go ahead and define a class mediator and here we have a list of users an empty array by default and we're going to have def add user with um, user of type chat user. Okay, so here we just want to add self.users.append with uh, user and we want to set the mediator for this user as well. So user.setMediator with self. Okay, so that is our add user, but we want to have a send message method, def send message. And here we want to have a MSG of type string. And we want the user that sent that message, chat user. Okay, for you in self dot self dot users, here we can say if you is different from user we don't want to send the same message to the actual to our own user to the user that sent it initially we say you dot receive you dot receive and here we have msg okay so we're just calling the receive method on each user that we have in our list Right, so that's all we need. Now let's go ahead and create our structure. So mediator is going to be a mediator instance. And let's create maybe three users. Alice equals chat user with the name Alice. Then we have Bob chat user with the name Bob. And then finally, let's add um, Carol is a chat user with the name Carol. Right, so we have our users. Now let's say mediator dot add user Alice and duplicate that twice. I'm going to add Bob and I'm going to add Carol. 
All right, so we have our structure. Now any one of these users can send a message. So I'm gonna say carol.send um, hi everyone. Right, so let's see how that works. Let me just run this and we get Carol is sending the message, hi everyone. And then Alice is receiving that message and Bob is also receiving that message. So we can see that we have this uh, mediator pattern where we have the central structure which is used to facilitate transmitting messages between our components, in our case, uh, multiple chat users. In this video, we're going to talk about the Memento design pattern. And to kind of quickly give you an idea of what this is about, think of a undo or redo system where you have, let's say, an editor and you want to um, store a trace of uh, states that you went through and operations that you did so that you can undo any operation that the user has done, whether it's writing something or deleting or, um, you know, whatever uh, keyboard shortcut they might um, use. You want to encapsulate that so that you can uh, have this chain of events that you can kind of go back and forth into. So this is a memento. We have some operations that the user does. For example, here we have multiple text edits and we encapsulate those with their own state into some quote unquote mementos, right? And then we can kind of move back and forth between this chain of operations. This will allow us to do an undo or redo and go back and forth. Um, now, so the memento at its core is simply a system to save and restore previous state without revealing the implementation details. So we don't care what the user actually did or what the uh, details are in each memento, we simply want to be able to move back and forth between the chain, uh, between elements of this memento chain. We have three main components. First of all, we have the memento, which stores the state, which is kind of the implementation or the details of what has been done. We have the originator, which creates the state, and we have the caretaker, which decides to save or restore the state. So the caretaker will allow us to move um, forwards or backwards in the chain. Now, usually in these kind of systems, you have um, undo, which goes back one element in the chain, and redo, which goes forward. But there's really no reason to uh, limit ourselves to one step. We can actually jump through the chain as much as we like, as long as we have the uh, ID of the element of the memento that we want to get to. All right, so um, let's go ahead and implement this in code to see how this might work. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file here called memento. Now here we're going to define, first of all, we want to use data classes. So we're gonna say from data class, from data classes, import data class. And we're going to create an at data class and we're gonna call this memento. And we're gonna just store one attribute, which is state, and we're gonna make that a string. So let's define an originator. This is, remember, this is the one that creates the state for us, creates the mementos. And let's override the init method where we pass a state and we're gonna store it self.state equals state. Okay, so we have that. Now let's go ahead and create a function called create memento. And here we will simply return memento of state, self.state. Okay, and then we have restore memento. And here we have memento of type memento. And here we just say self.state equals memento.state. Okay, so here is where we keep the current state of the system. And then we're going to define a class caretaker. Okay, here we will have a memento list 
Okay, or you could call this mementos with an S at the end, it doesn't really matter. Let's define a save underscore state function where the state is of type memento. Okay, self dot memento list dot append, we're going to add the state. Right, so we have our state uh, or rather our memento in our memento list. And we're going to define restore self and index of type int. And here we just return memento list, sorry, self dot memento list of index. Right, so that is all that we need. You can see the actual implementation is quite simple. Let's go to our main. And here, what I would like to do is I would like to create a few states. We will add them to our list and then we will move back and forth between the states. So first of all, we're going to have an originator. Originator. That's going to be originator of. Um, we're going to call this initial state. Okay, and a caretaker, that's going to be an instance of caretaker. All right, so um, we're going to say caretaker dot save state. And here, we're going to have originator dot create memento. Okay, so we have uh, saved our first state in our caretaker. Let's print a message. And here, I'm going to have an f string current state is originator dot state. Right, so this is my original state. So now let's update this. So originator dot state is going to be state one, let's call this. And then we're going to say caretaker dot save state originator dot create memento. And then I would like to print the current state again. So let me just copy this and paste it here. So we are now at state two. Um, let's create another one. So we have another state, copy and paste that. State two, originator.createMemento, that's fine. And then current state is, that's fine. Right, so we now have three states. So we can actually move between them as much as we like. So we can say originator dot restore memento. So here we can provide the required memento and we're going to say caretaker dot restore and we need to provide the index. Let's go up one. So from state two to state one, right? So that is going to be one and we're going to print the current state. Okay, so copy and paste that. So we have moved to the first state or rather we have state zero, state one and state two. Okay, we have moved to state one, but let's move to the state zero, quote unquote. So we can say originator dot restore and caretaker dot restore zero. Okay, and we're going to print the current state and then we can actually jump to the last state, right? We don't need to go step by step. We can just jump between them. So we can say originator dot restore memento, caretaker dot restore to two, and we can print the current state, right? So that is all there is to it. We kind of jump around between the states that we have. Let's go ahead and run the code. So what do we get? We get the current state is initial state. Then we move to state one. Then we move to state two. We go back one, right? So we go to state one, we go back to zero. So we have initial state and then we kind of jump straight to state two, bypassing state one. So current state is two. Okay, so you can imagine um, a system where these states are dynamically generated based on user actions and the system will kind of go back and forth. Of course, um, a, a real world system like an editor would go back one or forwards one, but as you can see, we can jump around if we need to. So that is the implementation of the memento pattern.
In this video, we will talk about the observer design pattern. And this design pattern is one of the most useful ones and one of the most common ones. So you will see it quite often in various projects and um, in a lot of code, in a lot of components in the code. So what it does at its most uh, basic is, let's imagine we have two components. One is kind of a time intensive processing unit that does some processing in the background and at some point will return a result. And we have on the right side, we have a user of that result. Now, this is not an actual user. It's not an actual person, uh, more of a component in the application, right? So here, um, the user requires this result. So it's waiting for it. And it has basically two options. One option, kind of the naive um, implementation would be to uh, periodically poll this time intensive processing unit just to ask for the result. And as it's shown here, you ask it once, it says no, is it ready yet? No, not yet. Is it ready? No, is it ready? No. So you can ask many, many times, um, you will get the result no until eventually you will get the yes. So of course, this would lead to a lot of communication back and forth and a lot of wasted kind of processing, right? And this problem would get exponentially worse when we have multiple of these users. So if everybody starts to poll at the same time, if we have dozens or hundreds of these users, then that could cause a major issue where um, we cannot deal with that amount of communication, right? So we need to find a better solution. Obviously, the solution would be to implement some sort of middle layer here that groups together this communication so that we don't have to pull it um, many, many times. So we implement some sort of registry here that is simply kind of waiting for the time in intensive processing unit to finish uh, and return the result. So as soon as the result is returned, we can start to notify the intended users. So how this, the way this works is the users basically register uh, their interest to this result. Um, and as soon as that becomes available, then they will get notified. We can also have in this uh, kind of architecture, we can also have multiple types of results um, that can become available. So the users uh, or the com interested components would register their interest for specific uh, results or sp for specific types of results. And then they get, they only get notified when those results come in. So to kind of sum up, um, the observer pattern, it describes, it defines a subscription mechanism. Similarly to how you might subscribe to a newsletter online, or, um, you might purchase a subscription to your favorite newspaper in real life and get it delivered to your home. This is a very similar mechanism where users subscribe for events that they're interested in. We can notify multiple objects simultaneously. So whenever some result gets, um, is available, then multiple, uh, interested parties get notified. And also we can have multiple types of events notifying multiple objects. So there's kind of a one to many relationship where we have multiple interested parties to one um, one object, right? One type of response. Of course, we can have multiple types of responses, but each individual type of response can have multiple interested parties. So to kind of sum up in a bit more pseudocode kind of architecture, we have here an event generator and we have the event manager. The event manager gets notified when the events um, are available and it retrieves a, it has or stores a list of subscribers, right? The list of subscribers um, can be updated whenever a new subscriber comes in or a subscriber leaves. And then when the event gets uh, becomes available, then we notify the subscribers. We have a standard subscriber interface that is implemented by whoever in is interested in that event. And then they have an implementation, a method that gets called when the event becomes available. Right, so that is the theoretical introduction. Let's go to code and have a look at how we can implement this. So here I will create a new file and I'm gonna call this observer. Right, so first thing I'm gonna import from ABC, import ABC and abstract method. 
okay so that we can uh, create some abstract classes so the first one is going to be event listener that inherits from abc and we'll define an abstract method called def update and here we have an event type of type string and let's say a file okay we want to notify when that file becomes available and for now we have pass now we have a class event manager okay and here um, we will I don't need these parentheses we can override the init method and we can add a um, operations list operations um, and here we can store itself dot operations equals operations all right now we can also have a self dot listeners that is a dictionary by default and we're going to say for op in operations we instantiate those listeners so self dot listeners of op of operation equals a list so for each operation we have a list of listeners okay it's empty for now right so let's define a subscribe method where we have an event type of type string and we have a listener which is going to be an event listener so this is very simple we just say users equals self dot listeners of event type okay and we just add our user to these users or our listener to these users so users dot append and here we have our listener right so this is the subscribe now we need the opposite def um, unsubscribe and here we just need the uh, actually we need both we need the event type type of type string and we need a listener of event listener okay so very similar to what we've done here I'm just going to copy this paste it so we retrieve the uh, users of the event type and we instead of append we will use remove uh, remove the listener all right so that is the uh, users or subscribers list and then we need a notify method of event type um, and a file okay so here we simply retrieve the event type so users equals self dot listeners of event type and then we want to notify or update those users so we're going to say u dot update of event type and file um, and here we have for you in users all right so we just notify all these um, interested parties now um, we're going to have an editor class that generates our events so editor events equals um, event manager of and we have let's add two types of operations we have an open and we have a save we can of course have as many as we want but we're just going to limit to these two and then file equals none um, by default so let's define an open file method which has a file and here we can say self dot file equals file and then uh, let's print a message an f string saying something like editor um, opening file and we can print out the file here all right so we open the file so of course we need to notify everyone of this event so self dot events dot notify okay and here we can notify of the event open and the file all right so that is the open file functionality 
Um, we can also have a save file. So def save file of self and the file that we want to save. And this is going to be uh, quite similar. We're going to say print. We don't need to save the file because it first we assume it's open before we save it. So we already have the file stored and we can say print um, editor. Um, instead of opening file, we'll say save or saving file and let's print the file here. All right, and then we can notify the event. So self.events.notify and here we have save and file. Right, so that is our editor. It simply allows us to generate events and call the manager to update everyone interested. Now let's define some listeners. So of course um, we need to implement the event listener uh, abstract class, right? So here we will have two listeners. First one is going to be an email listener that will um, kind of send emails whenever an event has occurred. And the second one will be a logger that will basically log events. So the first one class email notification listener, this will implement event listener. And we need to uh, first of all, let's define or override our init and pass here the email um, that we will quote unquote update or send emails to. So self.email equals email. Okay. And then we need to implement the update method that we have defined here. So def update. Okay, we have our file. So here we can simply print the message to kind of simulate sending that email. And we can say email to self dot email. And we can say some, let me just, uh, there we go. Um, we can say someone has performed um, event type operation on the file file. And that's pretty much it. We can just simulate sending that email. We don't need to actually implement that functionality. So that is one listener. Let's define another one. Let's say log um, open listener. That's going to be an event listener. Here again, we need to def uh, override our init method. And we have log file self dot log file equals log file. Okay. And we need to override our update or rather implement our update method. And here we can say something similar. So print an F string, um, save to log self dot log file colon, um, someone has performed event type operation on the file file. All right. So that is our listener. Those are our two listeners. So all that's left to do is put this together in our main function. So main, we have our editor equals editor. Okay, instance of that editor. Let's instantiate our listener. So email listener equals email notification listener. And here we need to pass an email. So let's say test at gmail.com. And then we have our log listener. That's going to be a log open listener. And here we have, let's say, path to file path to log file dot text. Okay, so we have our two listeners. So let's go ahead and so start to subscribe to events. So we can say editor dot events dot subscribe. And we want to subscribe to open events with the log listener. But we also want to subscribe to save events. So editor dot events dot subscribe to save events 
log listener. So we want to log everything. However, for the email, we only want to email when we have a save, let's say. So editor.events.subscribe, save, and um, email listener. All right, now editor, let's generate some events dot open file and here test dot text and editor dot save file. Okay, um, why do we need a file here? We don't really, let me update this. I don't, uh, we don't actually need to save the file to pass the file here because we already have it. So self dot file and notify self dot file. All right, so that is looking good. I think that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and run the code. There we go. So no problems. Editor has opened the file and then we can see that immediately the uh, log um, uh, log listener has uh, printed out a message. Someone has performed an open operation. And then as soon as we save the file, both listeners will um, you know, print out a message or rather get notified, right? So someone has performed the save, someone has performed the save. This, the first one is for the logger and second one is for the emailer. So this is how it works. Um, whenever we generate an event, the uh, event manager will notify every subscriber, right? So we can subscribe or unsubscribe to various events. All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about the state design pattern. So the state is basically um, thinking of your code or your program as a state machine, or in our case, a state algorithm. That simply means that um, your algorithm can only be in a certain number of predefined states and cannot kind of deviate from those, right? So we have this example here of a, um, let's say a uh, article on a blog post or on a new site, and it can go through, let's say three um, steps or three states. The first one is going to be draft where the author just creates the, uh, the article. Then it moves into moderation where the, um, let's say someone else would come in and check the article to make sure it's fit for production and then it will get published, right? Now from moderation, it can go back to draft. So we can move back in the kind of stack of states, um, but it can also go forward. So here we have the option. However, there are some states that cannot move uh, between them. So for example, it cannot go from published to moderation. It has to be, uh, it has to go from published to draft and then to moderation, right? So there are some limitations in how you can move through this um, tree or through this chain of states. You can go from some to others, but not from, um, you know, certain ones to other ones. Importantly, also the state itself is encapsulated in an object that we can pass around in our uh, code as we need to. So the object, uh, an object changes its behavior based on an internal state. So depending on which state we are on, we can update our code um, when we receive that state object. So this is encapsulated in an object, it gets passed to some component and that component updates its internal uh, logic based on the state it receives. At any moment, there's a finite number of states a program can be in. So as we've seen here, we have only three in our example. Of course, you will define um, as many as you require in your code. And then state can be encapsulated in object as we discussed. All right, so that's it for the quick introduction. Let's move to code and see how we implement this in practice. Right, so let me just create a new file here called state. Now the implementation for this design pattern is um, logically quite simple, but we do have quite a bit of code to get through uh, to implement this, uh, to implement the state in our code. So what I would like us to think of is a game that has, let's say four states that it can be in. So first of all, we have the kind of welcome screen where we open up the game and are ready to start playing. We have the uh, playing state where the user or the, uh, the player is actually uh, engaged with the gameplay. Then we have the kind of pause or break state where we take a pause 
And then we find, uh, finally we have the end game state where the game has finished and we can kind of go back and restart the game. So we have the option to go back and forth through these states. So let's implement this in our code. All right, so the first thing we need is from future import annotations. Okay, we will need to use some classes before we define them. We will also need to import random and then from ABC import ABC and abstract method. Okay, so we can define some abstract classes. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to define a game class and let's override the init method. And here we need to, um, we don't need to provide any arguments, but we need to store self.state. And by default, at the beginning of the game, we will have what we call an welcome screen state. We haven't defined this yet, but we will shortly, right? Um, for the welcome screen state, we will need to define the uh, abstract class. So we will need to take a bit of time before we actually implement that. Right, so we also want a uh, function called change state where we pass the state object here and we update our internal one. Okay, self.state equals state. So that's all for our game. Now let's go ahead and define the abstract class for the actual state object. So class state of ABC. Here we have um, def init. We're going to override the init method and we need to pass a game to this method and we're going to store it here self.game equals game. And let's print out a message to see which state we are on. So we have an F string currently in self state. Right, so now we need to define our four methods that relate to our four states we have in our code. So first of all, abstract method, um, we have def on welcome screen. Okay. And we don't need any parameters and we're just going to pass for now. We have a second one def on playing self and we're going to pass. We have an abstract method def on, um, this is going to be on break. Okay, when we actually take a break from the game. And then the final one abstract method here we have def on end game. Okay, and pass. Right, so we have our state. So now we need to implement the four um, classes. So the first one is going to be welcome screen state. This is going to be a state. Okay, and I'm going to, we need to implement all these four abstract methods. Okay, so I'm going to um, implement abstract methods, select all of them and implement them here. Now, before we actually add functionality to these methods, uh, we will need to have all the other states as well. So it might be easier to just put up this, um, this structure for all the states. So let's add class um, playing state that inherits from state. And this will also, this will also implement all the abstract methods. Okay, so we have welcome screen, we have playing state, we will need the uh, class break state. Okay, um, let's implement the abstract methods. And then after that, we will go through each one and implement them correctly. And then class, the final one is going to be end game state, which also is a state. And we need to implement all the abstract methods. Right, so we have all this. So we have to go through each one and implement them um, step by step. So not here, the first one is going to be welcome screen state. So welcome screen state, um, we cannot move from welcome screen state to another welcome screen state. However, we can just simply print out a message saying currently on welcome screen. Okay, now we can move from welcome screen state to playing. So here we can say self.game 
dot change state and we need to pass a playing state with self dot game. Okay, so we move to that. Now from welcome to break, we cannot move, right? So here we're just gonna print a message from welcome to break not allowed. Okay, and then from welcome to end game, again, not allowed. From welcome to end game, not allowed. All right, so that is our welcome screen state. Now let's move to playing. So from playing to welcome screen, again, it's uh, we cannot move, so not allowed. From playing to welcome, not allowed. Here on playing, we are already here. So we're gonna print a message currently playing. For the break, from playing to break, yes, we are allowed to do that. So self.game.change state, we move to break state with self.game. And then from playing to game to end game, not allowed. So print. Um, actually, from playing to end game, we are allowed to do that. So self dot game dot change state um, end game state self dot game. We can finish the game um, at some point. All right, break from break to welcome. We are not allowed. So print from break to welcome not allowed. From break to playing, yes, of course, we can do that. So state playing state. Now, obviously, in a real world situation, you would not create a new playing state. You would retrieve the uh, existing one, but we're going to simplify our code here just to kind of, um, you know, work on the design pattern. Now, from break, we are already on break. So let's print that here currently on break. And then from break to end game, we are not allowed. From break, we can only go back to playing. So here we can say print from break to um, playing to end game, end game not allowed. All right, and the final one is the end game state. So uh, from end game to welcome, yes, we can go there. So game dot change state, welcome state, with self.game. From end game to playing, no, we cannot do that. So print from end game to playing not allowed. Okay. From end game to break, we cannot do that. So from end game to break not allowed. And then finally, print from or currently on end game. All right. Wow. That's quite a lot of print messages, but we got through it. So now all that's left for us to do is implement the main. Okay. So here we will instantiate a game and I want to introduce some randomness, uh, some random moves from one state to another. Okay. So I'm going to say for I in range of, let's say we're going to do 20 moves. Um, and we're going to say state equals random dot rand range of four. Okay, we have four states, we're going to introduce four um, possibilities. So if state is zero, then we can say print move to welcome. And here we can say game dot state dot on welcome screen. Okay, so we're trying to move to welcome. We might be able to, we might not, depending on which state we are currently on. Elif state equals one. Then in this case, we move to uh, playing. Okay, and we have game dot state dot um, on playing. Elif state equals two. Then we want to move to break. Okay, and we're gonna say game dot state dot on break. Okay, and else we are at the final step, so we can say print move to end game. Okay, and game dot state dot on end game.
All right, so that's pretty much it. If I haven't made any mistake, I did type more than 100 lines. So let's go ahead and try it out. All right, so it's working fine. Um, so let's have a look at what it's doing. So we start off in welcome screen state, then move to end game. Well, we are not allowed. We try to move to break. We're not allowed. End game, end game, welcome. We're currently on welcome. Um, break, not allowed. Playing, that's fine. We can move to playing from playing. We try to move to playing about three times, not allowed, but then we try to move to break, right? So we can do that. So it kind of goes on like this for a while. It sometimes manages to move to a state that's allowed. Most of the times it would probably not do that, right? But we can see how we can move from one state to another in our game. This is how we um, implement a state um, design pattern. Of course, it will be a bit more complex in a real world situation, a real world system where you need to store a lot more information in your state so that you can uh, pass it around and your components will update based on that. But the concept of a state machine um, is uh, very similar to what we did here.